Hey there, fantastic viewers. Welcome back to our channel. I'm Kronos, and we're diving right back into the action-packed world of My Hero Academia. But this time, we've got a twist that will blow your minds. What if Deka had the gamer powers? Part 2 is here, and trust me, it's a game-changer. So buckle up, hit that like button, and let's embark on this electrifying journey together. And before we jump in, I want to express my deepest gratitude for your unwavering support. Your enthusiasm fuels our creativity, and I can't thank you enough. So, if you're ready for the ultimate adventure, hit that subscribe button, join our community, and let's make this video epic. Chapter 8 Quirk Frog Girl Does whatever a frog can asterisk. Frog body, plus 20% attribute growth for agility, endurance, quickness. Hairless below the neck. Frog face. Face and voice features are hard to read for most people. Frog legs. Bonus to skills jumping and kicking. Increased general leg strength. Frog oil. Can secrete poisonous or paralytic oil from skin. Unlock skill frog oil secretion. Frog tongue. 20 meter long tongue with strength roughly analogous to arm strength. Unlock skill tongue control. Stomach inversion, can eject and clean stomach. Wall cling, can adhere to vertical surfaces, may be able to move depending on surface angle and texture. Unlock skill wall cling. Cold weakness, will feel sluggish below 10 degrees Celsius, will go into hibernation below 3 degrees Celsius. Take additional damage from cold-based attacks. Tsuyu and I were on the bus, going back to my place. It was the next Saturday, July 15th, my 15th birthday. For the moment we're looking at the analysis of her primary quirk talent. She also had talent called quirk, stamina body, which improved the growth rate of all her physical attributes by 25%, but did not increase skill growth rate like free runner or studious. Tsuyu was actually a bit anxious to spend her and use talent point so we were looking at her quirk to figure out which available talent would go best with it. I don't think you need free runner. I told her. You already have doubled up bonuses to agility and quickness growth. But they don't work on skills, she argued, and the immediate increases would get me over 50 in quickness, so I would get a bonus talent, too, and I'd be close for agility. But the bonus talents are randomized and tied to that attribute. I paraphrased the newest entry in the manual for her. There's no guarantee you will get something useful. Besides, you can get there on your own. Okay, take it off the list, Ribbit. She relented. Then that just leaves tough as nails and quirk, frog girl too. I said as I scratched off free runner. Hmm, <laughs> so you mused. Having damage resistance would be nice. In that case though, I said. I would still say you wait until we figure out how to unlock a cold resistance related talent or skill. And wouldn't it be better to focus on your quirk? The second level of her quirk would have given her a longer tongue and upgrade tongue control to prehensile tongue. Wall cling would also be changed to wall climb, meaning she could climb any wall or even hang from ceilings, or at least ones that would support her weight. She would also gain stronger oils with a new hallucinogen oil and also the ability to match her skin to her surroundings. Even though it was better known as a chameleon ability, some frogs could do it too. Still, I could understand why she wanted physical resistance after last Sunday. Taking 5% less damage from the tree would have spared me the need to use her bonus talent to save her. But that was also a circular argument. The one other thing I would say, I continued, is that you are fifth level. You get another talent next level. But since we don't know how long that will take, if you upgrade your quirk first, you will have more time to work on it and adjust to it. You talked me into it, Izuka-kun, she finally said. I didn't want to do that. I said quickly and a bit nervously. It's your life, your body, your talents. You should grow them however you want. And I will, she nodded. But that doesn't mean I can't get advice from my smarter and more knowledgeable best friend, right? I'm not sure if that is true. I deflected. 
but I'll be happy to let you borrow analyze or just talk things through with you whenever you want. Just let me know if I am getting pushy or anything. She nodded, and then hit the panel. The bus entered the city proper, and more people boarded at the next stop. So we closed the windows, and just quietly enjoyed the rest of the trip in each other's company. Mom had dinner waiting. The main dish was my favorite, her special triple pork katsudon. In addition to the normal pork cutlet, it also had strips of both ham and bacon. She had also made a fresh loaf of bread and bought grape jelly. Not the cheap, overly sweet purple stuff. Instead, a champagne-colored jelly with a pleasant tartness. We both knew Tsuyu had a fondness for jams and jellies, so mom got the good stuff. Mom also made a cherry cake with chocolate icing, and after eating dinner, we both received a large piece. I noticed the one mom took was smaller. It was all very good, and I maybe ate a bit too much. Okay, presents, mom announced after she and Sue cleaned up, both of them refusing my help. They walked into the living room, my mom carrying a stack of four wrapped boxes and two separate cards. Go ahead, mom urged me. So you nodded enthusiastically. The first card was from the Bakuga family. It had a humorous caption. Mitsuki Obasan wished me happy birthday and said she hoped my training was going well. I passed the card to the two of them to read. I told her that you have been working out, mom told me. She seemed to appreciate it. The second card was from my dad. There was nothing written, but it contained a 2,000 yen online gaming card. That is nice, mom said with a strained smile. Tsuya pursed her lips slightly. Okay, open the big one first. Mom relaxed and encouraged me. I did. It contained three books, Transitioning to Calculus, Ancient Japanese History, An International View, and Writing Guideposts. All three were skills books I had found at the bookstore. This was confirmed by the windows that popped up when I handled these copies. This will help me in school. Thanks, Mom. She looked happy and said, Keep going. The second package was only a bit smaller, but was heavier. I peeled back the paper, revealing an unfamiliar book. Really more like a tome, it was an older book with a leather cover. Tao of Kung Fu, I read. I wasn't sure if it would qualify as a skill book, she told me. But when I saw it at the used bookstore, I thought it looked like it should be one. And if not, at least it may be an interesting read. I removed the rest of the paper and tapped the cover. This book contains the skills Kung Fu Fundamentals, Meditation, Wing Chun Quan, and Tai Chi Quan. You do not qualify to learn Wing Chun Quan or Tai Chi Quan. Learning the remaining skills will consume the book. Proceed with learning Kung Fu Fundamentals and Meditation skills. Accept decline. You didn't mention that. So you noted, as we all looked at the message. I haven't seen a skill book like this before, I said as I hit decline. There have been skill books I couldn't use at all, but I've never seen a book with more than two skills. Like that one has both mathematics, basic and mathematics, advanced. And I also haven't seen one with some skills I could learn and some I couldn't. I guess I should figure out what I need to do to be able to get all four skills. But thanks, Mom. This is really cool. You're welcome, she said. Now, last one from me, and then Tsuyu's present. Don't be too hopeful about mine, Tsuyu added. I'm sure it will be great, I reassured her. My mom's last gift was smaller. Inside was something I had wanted for a while now. Final Fantasy 6 CR, I said reverently. They couldn't all be skill books. Mom gave me a light smirk. What is it? Tsuya asked. The definitive version of the best game from the old Square Enix company. I said, winding up. It's a 3D, fully voice remake that merges both the original game and the continuation. Plus, they added some new items and side quests. Some people claim that Final Fantasy VII is best, and other prefer number 18. But for my time, 6 has both the best story and gameplay. I forced myself to stop as the two of them exchanged glances. 
Right. I coughed with a bit of a blush. Now from Tsu Chan. My mom gave us an aside glance at the even more familiar name. I unwrapped the smallest package. It was a long, plastic clamshell box. Inside was a mechanical pencil, but not a simple or cheap one. It was made of military-grade aluminum. It was inlaid with blue stained and polished oak, and that was emblazoned with the UE logo. The box contained extra graphite and a replacement eraser. Wow, this is really nice. I smiled at Tsuyu. In fact, it might be perfect. That might be overstating it a bit, my friend countered flatly. But I thought it would be good for the exam. Yes, that too, I said, but I had another idea. They both looked at me expectantly. So I know we were going to watch movies tonight, I began, but I was thinking about something. Last week, when Sue got hurt, I thought about going into the reflective dungeon so I could meet with you, Mom. I thought you might come back with me or would be able to call for help when you were sent back here. Except I wasn't sure, and I didn't know what we would find. I haven't experimented with it yet, because you would worry about me, Mom. And if you came in with me, I would worry about you. Now there are three of us. Still too short of a full party. But we might still be enough to go into a reflective dungeon, and see what it is like. And watch out for each other, if it is too dangerous and we need to run. If you two are okay with it, I was thinking we could use Tsu's present. Its quality is above average, but its rank is still low, so it should be safe. What does that last bit mean, Izuka honey? Mom asked. Once Analyze hit level 15, I explained. It started showing two new stats on inanimate items. Quality and rank. Quality is how well it is made, how expensive the materials are, and things like that while rank seems to be like the item's level. Quality is set when the item is made, but rank improves as the reflective dungeon it cleared. Both of them combined determine how dangerous the dungeon is. I was thinking we could also test where we come back out when we leave. I kept going. If we aren't all together to start. See what the dungeon looks like, what the monsters look like. Maybe test all these fighting skills we've been trying to learn. I'm up for it if you both are, Tsuya said, but there was a hint I now recognized as anticipation in her voice. My mom studied us both. Then she appeared to make up her mind. All right, she said. We really should know how the dungeon thing works. So we can do this on one condition. If I say we leave, we leave. However it is we get out, as quickly as possible. Okay? Yes, I said immediately. Of course, Tsuyo agreed. Then let's watch the first movie, Mom suggested, to give our food time to digest. And then we will try this. That makes sense, Tsu said as I bobbed my head happily. Two hours and forty minutes later, give or take, we changed into workout gear, and then gathered around the pencil. So, Mom, I suggested, why don't you go into your room and shut the door? and Tsu Chan can sit on the couch. That will be a good first test of where we are on exit. Sounds good, Tsu so noted, and my mom nodded thoughtfully. First things first, mom said. You have your first aid kit, right? I keep it in my inventory all the time, I confirmed. Except that once. Tsu so shuddered slightly, and we each rested a hand on one of her shoulders. Next, Mom walked over to the fridge and pantry. Granola, jerky, and sports drinks. Store them, too. If we are going to be working out, we need to keep our energy up. I wonder if this stuff will help your actual energy? Tsu mused. So far it hasn't, I told her. But maybe things will work differently in the dungeon. Anything else, Mom? She shook her head. Then both women left me to assume their suggested starting locations. Analyze, I stated. You a branded mechanical pencil. A thoughtful gift and a really nice pencil. Durability, 30 thirtieths. Quality, 3 sevenths. Rank. I wasn't sure why quality was on a scale of 7, but decided it didn't matter. 
It was a bit subjective anyway. Most cars I had scanned had durability in the three or four digit range and probably cost a thousand times as much, but still only had a quality of one or two. And I wasn't surprised by the lack of rank either. Most items didn't have anything. Only a few had one or rarely two stars. I touched a pencil and ordered. Create reflective dungeon. It was an odd sensation. It looked like a movie wipe and felt like what I would imagine said scene transition would feel like from the inside. Mom was standing beside me. Tsuyu was sitting next to me, but without the couch under her, she had to adjust quickly to keep from falling. We were on a plane, like what you would see in the American Midwest. The grasses were amber and came up about to my waist. In the direction I felt was north, there were grayish mountains. To the west, there was a forest. But the trees were yellow and topped with pink. Are those old-style number two pencils? Mom asked, staring at them. Ribbit, Sue croaked in surprise. There was nothing special to the south or east, just plains as far as I could see. Dungeon Entry UA Mechanical Pencil Mooks, 39 of 39 Boss, 1 out of 1 unspawned We all looked at the message, before I dismissed it. It's good to know what to expect, I guess, so you commented. What does unspawn mean? It means the boss isn't here yet, I told her. We probably have to do something to make it show up. Let's start with the normal enemies first. Mom sounded nervous. Her wish was granted as the grasses parted with a gentle swishing. It was about half a meter shorter than me. It had a basically humanoid form, but was covered in brown, matted fur. It had a dog-like face. It was wearing rough, burlap tunic and breeches. It was carrying a modern commando knife, but it was about the size of a short sword to the creature. The blade was poorly cared for, visibly chipped and flecked with rust. It was also carrying a round shield. It's a kobold! My mom exclaimed softly. I was so proud of her in that moment. What's a kobold? Tsuya asked. A fantasy race, I explained. They are usually enemies and low tier ones. They show up in all kinds of books and game. Analyze. Pencil Cobalt. Trash mob from a low level dungeon. Level 1. Health, 20 twentieths. Stamina 5 out of 5. At that point, it finally seemed to notice us. Its nose twitched and only then did it see us. But is it hostile? Mom asked. In most stories, they are sentient. Maybe we can talk. As if in answer, the kobold threw back its head and howled. Then it charged us, knife first. That answers that, I said. Tsuyu and I both dropped into combat stances. We were ready to dodge its initial stab and counter. Only Mom moved first. She pointed at the kobold's hand. The knife was torn free, and an instant later, the handle slapped into Mom's palm. The monster blinked, looking at its empty hand in confusion. Tsuyu didn't squander the chance. She jumped forward and kicked the side of the monster's head. Rather than blood, pencil shavings were thrown off it. Tsuyu's attack didn't kill it. It lunged, fangs spread to bite her. I focused my energy and thrust my hands towards it. A ball of silvery energy exited my palms. The key projection hit the kobold in the chest, knocking it away from my friend. The monster whimpered, and then dissolved into a mass of graphite shards. All that was left behind was a tooth and... 5,000 yen? Mom asked no one, and pulled the two items to her suddenly empty hand, the knife having crumbled too. Really? I looked at the bill in her hands. Is it real? Tsuyu added. It looks like it. Mom studied the note. But I'm going to hang on to this for now. And what do you make of this? Analyze. Cobalt Fong. That was odd, and I told them. I've never seen such a short description before. We all looked at the message, and then I dismissed it. Mom handed the tooth to Tsuyu who studied it briefly. Then she offered it to me. But when I touched it, it vanished. Huh! 
Sue voiced her surprise. Where did it go? I don't know, I said. Inventory. There was nothing new in my box. It may be tied to your power in some way, Mom decided. In games, something like that would usually be a quest item. I mused, like collect 20 cobalt fangs. Maybe it is a hidden quest, or the gamer is collecting them for when I do get the right quest. That makes sense, Tsuyu agreed, finger on her lips. We should just give them to you, then, Izuku, Mom suggested. There isn't much point to carrying around random monster parts. Yeah, Tsuyu nodded. Okay, I agreed. Mom will take the money, and I will take the monster bits. I wonder if anything else will drop. That was easy enough, Tsuyu said. We should keep going. Mom looked dubious for a moment, and then nodded. Six or seven howls tore out all around us. Maybe I spoke too soon, Ribbit. Key detection, I said. You might want to name your moves, Tsuyu noted. Two to the north, closing fast, I told them. Two to the east, but they are further out. Three, no four now, to the south, right at the edge of my range. Take out the close ones first, right? Tsuyu suggested. And then maybe head west, since none are over there? Unless there is a reason they are avoiding the forest. Mom countered softly. If we do that, there is a chance they will converge on us. I said. I would go north first, then east. Then reassess, see if we can find any more or what the southern group does. That sounds like a sound plan. Mom agreed. Yes, Sia said. We moved to intercept the first pair of monsters. As before, our height and seemingly better vision let us spot them first. One was wearing the same sort of ratty clothing and carrying an old, dented softball bat. The second kobold actually had on leather armor, in reasonably good shape, and had a bronze short sword tucked into its belt. Analyze, analyze, I mumbled softly. Pencil kobold. Trash mob from a low-level dungeon. Level 1. Health 18 18. Stamina 4 out of 4. Pencil kobold. Recyclable mob from a low-level dungeon. Level 2. Health, 26 to 26. Stamina, 10 out of 10. Mom, I whispered, can you grab the sword and hand it to me? Both women looked at me curiously. But Mom pointed her right hand at the tougher monster and pulled its weapon to her. She passed it to me, even as she snagged the bat. The kobolds definitely noticed that and began to charge. I lifted the dagger and threw it at its owner but I was not counting on my mediocre throwing skill. Instead, I activated telekinetic attack as it left my fingers. The blade flew straighter and faster than most pitchers could have dreamed. It plunged into the kobold's armor. Analyze, I said again, even as I started running. Pencil kobold. Recyclable mob from a low-level dungeon. Level 2. Health, 11 26 Stamina 10 out of 10. I reached it a second later. My fist drove into its face, which hurt much less than hitting a redwood. Then I hopped up and kicked the pommel of the knife, forcing it deeper into the kobold's chest. That seemed to do the trick as monster and weapon crumbled. Tsuyu's tongue hit the second kobold in the neck with force of a right hook. It whimpered and grabbed for its throat. Tsu followed up with a pair of kicks to its knee and stomach. That was enough. The monster disintegrated. The second level monster dropped seven 1,000 yen bills, while the weaker one only dropped two 500 yen coins, plus another tooth. Mom gathered them, and then gave me the fong. Let's keep going. Mom seemed to have relaxed, after how quickly we took care of them. According to my status window, we had been in the dungeon for almost three hours, though it felt like only half of that. We were currently resting up against one of the giant pencil trees. That was a little rough, Tsuyu admitted, biting into jerky. Yeah, I sighed. Four of them, and all at least level three. I don't really approve of you playing tank, Izuku, Mom said. 
but I am the one with physical resistance and key regeneration. I reminded her, using the second skill to convert my energy into health, and draining one of the bottles of energy drink. As Sue suggested, in the dungeon it did actually refill my energy, and their stamina, if only a bit. I'm curious about that wolf meat, Tsuyu deflected from me. Besides the kobolds, we had also encountered some wolves. The wolves dropped less money than the kobolds. We were lucky to get one 50 yen coin off of them. But they also dropped wolf pelts, which I absorbed like the kobold fangs. And a few had also dropped wolf meat. That did not vanish at my touch, and Analyze gave a much more thorough description, claiming it was lean and delicious. I had stored the tenderlands in inventory, so they wouldn't go bad and we didn't have to worry about the smell attracting other monsters. Maybe I will try cooking some of it tomorrow. Mom offered then added. I wonder how we are doing. I lost count of how many enemies we have defeated, after you two both leveled up. Along the way, Tsuyu and I had both gained levels at the same time. She was now level 6, while I was level 5. Hmm. <laughs> I considered that. Dungeon status? Analyze dungeon? Quest? The first two did nothing, and there wasn't anything new under the quest tab. Or any other tabs. Nor was the occasionally growing manual any help. Key detection? My frequent use of the skill had increased its level and range. I feel one more monster, I said, but I still can't cover the whole island. It turned out the dungeon was an island, smaller than Indoru's area. Oh, and the grayish mountains? They were made of graphite. Do we want to go for it? I asked. Or should we retreat and come back later? I'm still fine, Tsuyu noted. On the party screen, I was in the worst shape. Tsuyu had lost a bit of health and used up some of her stamina, but she was still far ahead of me in both. Mom hadn't taken any damage yet, both of us being protective of her. But her stamina and psions were both low. I was at 70-120 health and 50-149 energy. I think we can continue, Mom said. Despite her complaint, she had grown more confident and comfortable with each victory. And she had been our MVP, disarming every kobold we had encountered. Except the one with the giant, two-handed axe. It had been too heavy for her. Fortunately, it was also too heavy for the cobalt. But if the boss does appear, we need to leave, she said firmly. We both bobbed our heads in confirmation. Even now, I sometimes tell her it was her fault for saying that, especially given our average luck score back then. Analyze. Pencil cobalt ace. Mob from a low-level dungeon. Level 5. Health, 60 sixtieths. Stamina, 30 to 30. This was the highest level monster we had seen so far. It had leather armor and a pair of commando knives. But the equipment was in much better shape. The armor was clean and fit the little monster perfectly, and the blades were sharp and unmarked. Not that it got to keep them for long. Mom pulled them both into her hands. She offered me one, but I shook my head. I wanted to preserve my energy for the moment. Tsuyu, the monster, and I all charged. Unlike the others, it did not drop its guard after being disarmed. It managed to block my first punch and leaned away from Tsuyu's kick. She still clipped it, but it didn't appear to be overly hurt. It pushed me back and tried to bite Tsuyu. I grabbed its arm and pulled it with me before twisting into a hip throw. It slammed into the ground though between the dirt and grass it was cushioned fall. Then Tsu's tongue smacked the side of its head. Analyze, I said again as I tried to stomp its stomach. I was only concerned about its health, which was still 4260. My stomp missed, and the kobold spun its legs out, forcing us back a bit as it regained its feet. Only for Tsu and I to sandwich its head in mirrored roundhouse kicks. It growled but shut up when I delivered a rabbit punch to its kidney. Or at least where its kidney should have been. Suyu's tongue snaked around its arm, locking it at extension. I grabbed the other limb, locking it in place. We started to kick it again, 
until we noticed mom walking over. So instead we kept it trapped, while she stabbed it in the neck with both knives. This time as the monster disintegrated, and the wind carried the graphite away, we were surprised. Two fangs, which was a first. A 10,000 yen bill amongst the cash, another first. And this time only one of the knives disappeared. Analyze. Ontario 6 Malawin Quacha's Navy Knife. Standard issue weapon for the U.S. Navy Elite Forces, formerly known as Navy SEALs. An excellent, multifunction combat knife. Durability, 248-250. Quality, 4 sevenths. Rank. Izuku Inko Obasan. Tsuyu was not looking at the knife like we were. She was looking behind us. I immediately turned, positioning myself between them and whatever had spooked Sue. The graphite from the monster we had just killed was swirling in a small tornado. It seemed to contain the remains of the other mooks, too. The shard gathered together and solidified. Il Fong, Mom gasped. She was wrong. Copyright issues aside, its fur was the dark green, not red. It wasn't big enough and it was carrying a war sledge instead of an axe or sword. Still, it was easy enough to see how she made the mistake, since the boss towered over us and appeared to weigh more than the three of us combined. Like the ace, its weapon and armor were in perfect condition. Unlike the ace, the boss was wearing a vest of chain mail over its leather armor and a steel skullcap. Analyze Cobalt Baron Boss of you a mechanical pencil Level 8 Health, 150-150 Stamina, 90 out of 90 Izuku, Mom called out Dungeon exit, I ordered Only for a loud buzzing to fill the air Exit disabled within dungeon boss's control zone You must leave the zone or defeat the boss How big is this zone? Tsuyu asked rhetorically Fight or run? I asked mom, as the beast roared. I'm not sure how far I can run, she admitted, and we don't know how big this control zone is. Just please be careful. I nodded, glaring intently at the boss. Do you want the knife? Mom asked. No, you hold on to it for now, I told her. I'll start with a Kirin blast. This fear of key slammed right into the boss's face. It barely seemed to notice. That name could use work. Tsuyu commented as she jumped forward, diving past the boss. As she passed, she kicked out at the back of its knee. Given how fat it was, and how skinny its legs were, it was a good idea. But the Baron didn't go down. I'm guessing that hammer is too heavy. Tsuyu shouted to my mom. Yes. Analyze. Cobalt Baron. Boss of you a mechanical pencil. Level 8. Health, 144-150. Stamina, 90 out of 90. Your combat vigilance has paid off. Analyze skill improved, LVL 20. Battle scan effect acquired. Battle scan. After you analyze an enemy, you can continue to see its basic status as long as you remain in combat. Sure enough, Floating over the kobold's head was a smaller window showing, Cobalt Baron HP, 142-150 SP, 90 90ths. Tsuya had smacked it with her tongue while I was reading the message, and I was a bit worried that the boss was taking noticeably less damage than the mooks. Mom, the helmet! I shouted. Her eyes widened. Kirin blast! I aimed for its gut this time, trying to keep its attention on me. It worked, and I had to drop almost to the ground to avoid the giant hammer. Gravity pull! I don't know if Tsuyu influenced her, too, or if Mom was just trying to focus. Instead of pulling the Baron's helmet to her, she just gave it enough of a tug that it fell down over the monster's eyes. It grunted in anger, and swung wildly. Tsuyu was forced to hop back, but I rolled closer. I came up in a crouch right next to it and threw three hard punches into the same knee Tsu had already hit. Cobalt Baron HP, 127-150 SP, 90 90ths. 
It let go of the hammer with one hand and swatted me away. I got my arms up to block, but still. Dash eight health. That stung, and I was thrown back. The Baron did not red drip its hammer. Instead, it reached up, wrenched off the skullcap, and threw it at Mom. She shocked me by catching it midair with her power, pulling it safely into her hands. The kobold roared and looked like it was going to charge her. Except Suyu's tongue plowed full bore into the wrist of the hand still handing the sledge. The angry shout turned into one of pain, and it dropped the weapon. The Baron decided to ignore us for the moment and reached for the hammer. Jet set run. I ordered key reinforcement, quickness. At the time, I didn't realize I had done it without speaking. It might have saved me trouble later, if I had. I darted forward and dove into the handle of the sledge. I wrapped my arms around it and rolled away from the Baron's grasping hands. I made it clear, but when I tried to lift it, the hammer felt heavier than Sue. Key reinforcement, strength. I hissed from the string. The bonus moved, and I was able, barely, to pick up the weapon. The Baron snarled at me and thundered towards me. Doing my best impersonation of an old Olympics hammer throw, I spun completely around. I drove the hammer into the Baron's side. The force knocked the boss down, but I stumbled too. Heavy swing. Strength plus one. Kobold Baron HP, 97 150 SP, 90 90th. Can you do that again? Sue asked quickly, inching closer. Yeah, I agreed. I think so. The Baron and I both climbed back to our feet. I lifted the hammer and clumsily placed it over my shoulder. It looked at me and snarled cautiously. I stepped closer, preparing to swing. Its eyes lit up and it charged again. It thought it could get too close for me to hit it with the hammer's head. But off to the side, Sue nodded. I rotated again, hammer as far out as it could go. As I did, Sue ran forward. When I reached a point where the sledge was the same distance as the Baron, just not far enough around the circle, she jumped. Tucking under in midair, she slammed her feet into the haft of the sledge. Then she jumped off with all her prodigious leg strength. Dash three health. The hammer accelerated, painfully wrenching my arms with it. The wood of the handle cracked. So you shot back, landing almost next to Mom, and Sledge slammed into the Baron's chest. Cobalt Baron HP, 57 150 SP, 90 90th. The Cobalt braced itself and stayed on its feet. It reached down and grabbed the handle, preparing to take it back from me. But I just let go. Instead, I stared at the handle. I forced myself to remember that branch, stabbing through my best friend. Utah smash! I roared, karate chopping the point Sue had damaged it. The half broke cleanly in two. The boss looked down at me, its eyes practically glowing. It dropped both halves of its weapon and threw back its head. It howled. This howl was different. It shook my whole body. Status ailment resisted. I glanced back and quickly said, Analyze. Name, Inko Midoriya. Race, Human, Quirk Metagene Positive. Age, 36. Level, 17 Active. Title, Hardworking Mother. Health, 187-187. Stamina, 13-126. Scions, 7 190. Condition, stunned. I hadn't realized she had gained a level in the last few months. But more important was her condition and the fact that she seemed to be locked in place. Tsu wasn't moving either, so I knew she had been stunned, too. It was only thanks to Gamer's mind that I was still moving. I needed to protect them until the effect wore off. Then the Baron howled again. But this one was different, and was immediately echoed. Graphite swirled, and formed into two wolves. The boss barked, and they started to move towards Mom and Siu. It grinned down at me sadistically. Kobold Baron HP, 57-150 SP, 30 90 Those two powers had cost it most of its stamina. 
I hadn't been paying enough attention to see what each cost. Whatever the case, it could use only one of the skills again. It raised a fist to punch me. I ignored it, scrambling to where it dropped the hammerhead. I picked it up, turned, and threw it at the first wolf. I imparted telekinetic force onto the metal lump. It crashed into the wolf's head, crushing it. The rest of its body vanished. Unfortunately, I was too far to keep the second wolf from reaching to you. And the baron was towering over me, swinging what was left of the sledge's handle like a crude club. I prepared to roll with the hit, hoping it wouldn't put me in the negative. Then the pole popped out of its hands. It flew over to my mother, who was panting from effort. She caught it roughly, and then slammed it into the side of the wolf about to malt Sue. The lupin monster tumbled away. Mom shook to see you, which seemed to snap her out of it. The Baron recovered, and prepared to howl again. No you don't, I told it. Sure you can. I threw a jumping uppercut straight into its jaw. It whimpered as its teeth snapped shut on its tongue. Kobold Baron HP, 48-150 SP, 10 90ths. No trademark infringement. Mom scolded me as she and Sue finished the wolf and turned back towards us. Sorry, I said sheepishly. It was a spur-of-the-moment impulse. Disarmed, not enough stamina for its special moves, and only one-third health left, the Baron looked at us nervously. Then it steeled itself, and tried to punch me in the face. I blocked and dodged together, and drove my other fist into its elbow. Then I slid in, and kicked its damaged knee again. This time there was a crack and the beast's leg folded under it. Tsuyu rejoined us with two-footed jump kick to the side of its head. Mom stayed back, but she had both the knife and club at the ready. Kobold Baron HP, 22-150 SP, 10 90ths. Last push, I told myself, tired due to my low energy. Disable jet set run, key reinforcement. Tsu's tongue slapped its face twice. Unable to stand, it tried to force her away, but she was too nimble. Dragon burst? I called out tentatively. It was the same key projection and hit the cobalt in the chest. Better, Tsuyu commented. Maybe we should forget the names, Mom commented. I don't know, Tsuyu countered. I like the All Might riff. Maybe more like that. Even as she said it, she kicked the Baron again. That claimed the last bit of its health, and it crumbled. Level up. Level 6. Attribute points, plus 7. Skill points, plus 3. Talent points, plus 1. Mom and Tsuyu had similar windows, albeit with higher levels and fewer bonus points. The haft also disintegrated out of Mom's hand, but the head portion of the hammer remained. Mom scooped up the cash the boss dropped without even looking at it. Analyze. Broken weapon. Another short description. Tsuyu so noted as she read my message box. Then she picked it up and handed it to me. As expected, this time it vanished as soon as I touched it. Let's go, before there are any more surprises, Mom said. Exit dungeon. You a mechanical pencil complete. Defeated 20 enemies, rank plus. Defeated 40 enemies, rank plus. Defeated boss, rank plus. Level 1 cleared, rank plus. The message appeared before our eyes, even as we returned to reality. We were all standing in the kitchen. The pencil was still on the table. I immediately said, Analyze. You a branded mechanical pencil. A thoughtful gift. It is exceptionally comfortable and the graphite never seems to break. Durability, 50-50. Quality, 3 sevenths. Rank. Mom was also still holding the knife. She set it on the table and emptied the cash from her pockets. Without needing to speak, we began to sort and count it. 1,467,500 yen. Almost three quarters of what my dad made each month and we acquired it in just under four hours, most from the boss. It wasn't enough to buy a car, 
but it was still a decent amount of money. Especially to a pair of teenagers. What do we do, Ribbit? Tsuyu asked flatly. Mom got out a paper bag and put the money in. I'm going to take it to the police tomorrow, she said firmly. Turn it is as something we just found on the ground like it was trash. They will see if it is real and if it is reported stolen or missing. And if none of those issues come up, they will return it to us. Okay, Sue and I sighed in unison. One million, one hundred four thousand, five hundred yen. Two weeks later, the money was indeed returned to us, after taxes on it were taken out. Still, I wonder where it came from. Mom wondered, the three of us gathered around the table again. Maybe it is lost money, I said. You know, money that was blown away, dropped in the sewer, or burned in a fire. Maybe the gamer can somehow pull it in and fix it. That might explain why sometimes they drop out amounts of bills and coins, Tsuyu added, instead of just the most efficient combination. Either way, it is ours now, Mom said, and I would say we earned it. She split it into four piles. 300,000 for each of us, she said, and I think the remaining 200 and change should go to you, Izuku. Me? I stammered. Boo, but you two did as much as I did. Mom, it would have been a lot harder without you disarming them. And Tsuyu finished the boss. But it is your power, Tsu countered. Without it, we wouldn't have any of this. Exactly, Mom agreed. I wanted to argue, but then I smiled. Okay, I'll take it. Then I'll give it to you, Mom, to pay back the advance on my allowance, and to pay you for babysitting. Ha! Huh. Tsuya laughed. Fine, Mom chuckled. But don't think this means you are getting an allowance anymore. Not when you can just jump into a paperclip and come out with 50,000 yen. And to think I was just joking about you're the gamer making money. We all laughed at that. At least for the moment but she really did stop giving me an allowance. And in case you are wondering, mom kept the knife. After giving it a thorough cleaning, she used it for cooking. Later that afternoon, after Tsuya left to pick up her siblings, I went shopping. I had to replace my tracksuits, as they were getting a little short and a lot ragged. Plus I grabbed three more sets of the weight expansions. After stowing them in inventory, I went to the bookstore. There wasn't much new, but I already had a list of over a dozen books I could currently use. I grabbed a basket and started filling it up. I didn't want to spend all my new money, but if it could help me get into UA, I would spend most of it. I rounded one of the shelves and nearly ran into someone. Dodge and karate seemed to kick in, and I danced effortlessly around her. Maybe I should look for dancing books, flashed through my head. Sorry. I said, bowing. No, I was not looking either, Midoriya kun. It was the blue haired girl, and she knew my name. I'm sorry, have we met? I prompted regretfully. I recognize you from school and Kakin, Bakuga's funeral, but I don't recall us being introduced. You accidentally made her day. Charisma plus one. No, not officially, she confirmed tentatively. But you are famous at Aldera 4. Being quirkless, I filled in sadly. Yes, she nodded. I am Mizuno Ami. You are? The top scorer? The rumored genius quirk? I don't have a genius quirk, she said quickly. Not intelligence, memory, or other informational quirks. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't mean to imply anything. It's just no one knows what your quirk is, and your scores are perfect, so people just assume. No, I am sorry, she said. I do hide my quirk, and I know you have reasons not to deride others. It just makes me upset that most people think I get my grades through a power rather than hard work. Can I ask what your quirk is? I prompted carefully. So I can correct anyone else I hear saying that? She smiled shyly and nodded. She took a water bottle out of her bag. Mizuno-san held it up and then released it. It dropped slightly and then stopped in midair. 
I looked at it closely and realized what had happened. The water had not moved, but the container itself had dropped and the air was now at the bottom. Hydrokinesis, I said. You are holding up the water, not the bottle. Yes, she seemed impressed. I call it ice water because I can control both water and ice, and it works better the closer they are to zero degrees. How much can you control? I prompted, reaching for a hero note that wasn't there. I don't know, she admitted. I've never tested it. When I first used it, another boy in my class was drowning. He had turned into metal in the pool and sank to the bottom. I lifted a square of water out of the pool and held the rest back until he was rescued. Well, I was amazed. With a quirk like that, you will be an amazing hero. I'm not going to be a hero, she denied, shaking her head. Then she looked down at the books in her arms. College-level material. I am planning to be a doctor like my mother, she added. Oh, that's too bad, I said. I think you would make a great hero. Plus, it would be nice to have another person from Alder at UA with me. You are really going to try out for Yue? She blinked. Even though. She blushed at bringing up my supposed infirmity. I just smiled. To that I have two things to say. I told her confidently. First, is that not all heroes have great combat powers. You raise her head. Have you heard of him? He avoids the press and doesn't market himself. So he's not very well known. Anyway, his quirk lets him shut off other people's quirks. The exact limits haven't been published, but either way, that means that physically he is just a normal person, making villains fight him on even terms. At midnight, if her sleep pheromone doesn't work on a villain, she also had to take them down with just tools and martial arts. So if someone works hard enough, they might be able to be a hero, even if they have a weak quirk, or even none at all. Her eyes flickered over to my arms which were a little thicker and a lot more defined than they had been three months ago. And second, I lowered my voice conspiratorially. Just like everyone knows you have a genius quirk, everyone knows I am quirkless. Are you saying? She gasped slightly. I am saying that things change, and just because the majority of people believe something doesn't make it real. Like how everyone knew Jobs was quirkless because his father was allergic to apples. She studied me for a moment, then looked at the books in my basket. Well, it was nice to formally meet you, Mizuno-san, I told her. I will let you get back to your shopping. Years later, Ami told me that if I had looked back in that moment, I would have seen her take a Taekwondo manual off the shelf. Chapter 9 It was July 30th, Sunday. The day after we got the money back and I spent a bunch of it on supplies. Since summer vacation had started, we had to switch up our training schedule. Tsuya had to spend more time with her siblings. So mom had stepped up and watched them three days a week while Tsu and I trained. And, at least for the past two weeks, I had taken the three Ajui siblings out one day each week. First to an amusement park, and once to a water park. As Sunday... It was one of our normal training days. We were done, so now we were working on our summer homework. Mom was cooking dinner, and the kids were playing Mario Party Delta on my Nintendo Destiny. At least we told the kids that. They didn't seem to realize that being from different schools, our assignments would be different. In reality, we were looking at Tsuya's menu, invisible to anyone not in my party. See, when we were training today, Tsuyu had reached 50 in agility. The three bonus talents had been an easy choice. One offered 10 levels and a limit break for ballroom dancing. The second was the same, except for acrobatics, a bit more useful. The third talent was free runner, so she selected that. Which, in turn, put her over 50 in quickness, bringing up another option window. This one was much less obvious, so she let it sit there until we could rest and talk about it. Congratulations. Quickness has reached peak human tier. Please select a bonus talent. Tongue cannon. Makes your prehensile tongue faster. Sidestep. Makes your dodge faster. Speed strike. 
special attack when moving quickly. When I analyzed the talents, the first two were the same, except for the skills they changed. In both cases, they changed the skill from a pure agility skill to a hybrid agility slash quickness skill, and also limit broke the skill. Speed Strike had a cost of 5 stamina per attack, but increased the power of a punch or kick if you were moving faster than 25 kph. I don't know about this last one, Tsuyu admitted softly. It has a good bonus for the cost. But even though I can run faster than 25 kph, I would have to gain some distance and accelerate to meet that speed. Realistically, I could only use it once or twice a battle. Maybe not. I whispered back. After all, it only says you need to be moving at that speed, not running. I don't know what your top speed is for a single jump, but if it is over 25 then this might be a good attack for you. Hmm, maybe, Tsu mused. But I don't want to pick it, only to find out my jumps are too slow and it will take me forever to make them fast enough. I think you should buy the dodge power, Mom offered, bringing dishes over to the table. I set down my pencil and started distributing the bowls. Plates would have to wait until Tsu and I put our books away. You just say that because you want us to stay safe. My friend immediately pointed out, though she did not sound upset by the fact. That is part of it, Mom admitted wistfully. Maybe even most of it. But the fact is, as heroes, you won't be able to help anyone else if you are hurt yourself. Mom considered for a minute and then added, And I don't really understand why dodge is not tied to quickness to begin with. If you are too fast, I explained, you might move too far, or lose control and hurt yourself. Speed is important, but flexibility and control are more important. Then I smiled sheepishly. And from a design perspective, just tying dodge to both agility and quickness might be overpowered, but spending a talent to get that isn't? This isn't a game, Tsuya pointed out. Tell that to my power. My smile grew slightly. Well, I was leaning toward tongue cannon, my friend continued. But now I'm back on the fence. Your tongue is one of your biggest advantages, I said thoughtfully. I can see why you would take any chance to make it better. What would you do, Izuku? Tsuya asked me. Honestly? I said. I would probably flip a coin between Tongue Cannon and Speed Strike. Speed Strike is the most powerful of the three, but you are right about the drawbacks, especially if there is a chance you can't jump fast enough or jumping didn't work with it. But having your tongue be faster and being able to go past 100 in the skill is almost too good to pass up. I'd research my jump speed, Sue said, but I'm not sure if there is any sort of limit on the selection. It has been almost two hours, but what if after four hours it just picks for me? So I'm going to go with Tongue Cannon, and I can maybe get the other ones later. She tapped the top panel, and then she looked at me firmly. What about you, Izuku? Shrew prompted. You have two talent points now, right? Don't you think you should spend at least one of them? I want to, I said, but I also worry that I might miss out on something better. Or there might be a time when I suddenly could need a talent I didn't buy, and now I can't. You are still in thinking about the storm, Mom noted, bringing the salad bowl over. Today she was making a more western-style meal, wolf steaks, fresh bread, and a light salad with tomatoes and strawberries. Yes, I agreed, even more softly than our current whispers. Then why don't you get Key Apprentice, Mom suggested. So you have key healing? What if I encounter a situation where key healing isn't enough? I countered. In that case, psychic healing wouldn't serve you any better. Mom reminded me. Why not? Sia asked. You never told me what the difference is. Key healing is basically like natural healing. I said. Only a little better and a lot faster. For example, if someone had taken a hit that damaged their lung... Key healing could restore it, because lungs can regenerate under the right circumstances. But if your whole lung had been removed, there is nothing key healing could do about it. Psychic healing could, though. It can heal pretty much anything, if the patient is alive. The counter is psychic healing is hard. 
It takes six talents to even unlock the Psi Biology Tree. And then, like a doctor, you have to know what you are doing. Plus it takes a lot more energy, from what talents and skills I can see right now. Key healing only takes two talents, and takes less energy. And you don't have to know what you are doing. At least not from a medical or biological standpoint. You just send your key into the target with the intention of healing, and the target's own cells and key do the rest. It sounds like it would be good to have both, Sia said. It would be nice, I agreed, but to have both types at a reasonable level would take a lot of talents and skill levels. And in an emergency, Mom pointed out, buying a psychic healing power is going to be less useful than a key one. Improving an existing one is another matter, but you are not there yet, Izuku. Hmm, <laughs> the frog girl considered then said, well, personally, I was going to suggest you take tactile telekinesis. Why is that? Mom asked her. Because when we apply for UA, we have to tell them what our quirk is. Suyu answered. And Izuku could list tactile TK as his quirk. Then she turned and addressed me. That would cover most of your powers. Key reinforcement is only slightly different than telekinetic aura, right? If you don't get hurt because of gamer's body, it could just be attributed to your TK defenses. If I accidentally use regular telekinesis, I continued her train of thought. I could just say that my power is growing or something. Even key projection, in its current state, would be like me forcing a burst of air away from me. It will get you closer to psi biology. Since you have to have either that or microkinesis, right? Mom reminded me and maybe explained to Tsuyu. Tsu hadn't known about the gamer as long, and with our training schedule it was harder to just sit down and talk about powers. Hers, mine, or others. And if you do it now, that will give you around seven months to practice it for the exam. Tsuyu said. And decide on names. There is that. I agreed. I don't know why you two are so fixed on naming your moves. Mom sighed. There's a bunch of reasons to name your attacks. I said and they told me later my eyes started twinkling. Names act as a mnemonic device, conditioning our minds to perform the move, making it easier. It also can serve like a ki, helping to distract an opponent and regulate breathing. And if you become famous and your moves are well known, you can call one move and use another to catch your opponent off guard. That one is a bit harder given the mnemonic conditioning part. Plus you can't do it too often, or the villains could get wise to it. It's also for branding, Tsuyu added. Think about how much more you pay for an All Might doll. Action figure, I interjected. That says Texas Smash. My friend ignored me. When you push the button to make it punch. That makes sense, Mom relented. Then she looked at me. What are you going to do, Izuku? I guess I will still have one left if I need Key Apprentice. I murmured and it would be good to get used to those powers. Okay. I flipped over to the talent screen and scrolled down to the telekinesis tree. Mom and Tsuyu both watched as my finger hovered over the button. I thought I had decided, but it wasn't an easy thing. Is it time to eat yet? I flinched forward as Satsuki's voice called out right next to my ear. Talent tactile telekinesis acquired. Overall psionic rank. 2. Overall telekinetic rank, 2. Skill telekinetic armor available. Skill telekinetic aura available. Skill tactile telekinesis available. I'm going to have to stop doing that, I told myself. The next few months seemed to go by very quickly, especially after summer vacation ended. We settled into a new routine. Instead of going to Endora on Monday through Saturday, Tsu, Mom, and I went into dungeons. It saved Tsuyu and I the bus trip out to the park, and was shorter for her going to pick up her brother and sister, so we had more time. We still went to the park on Sundays in September and October, but by November it was getting a bit cold for Tsuyu. Then we switched to a dungeon on that day, too. But I removed Mom from the party first, we always used the pencil of solitude, and I invited Mom again as soon as I saw her. 
That was how I was able to confirm that party invite only worked on line of sight. I pondered if one of the hidden menu tabs was a friend list, but nothing happened, so I guess there wasn't an easy way to add people to my party remotely. When I say dungeons, they were all pencils. My mom bought a giant pack of cheap, plastic pencils, and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, the three of us cleared one of them. The enemies and environments varied, and the monsters were a lot weaker and the drops a lot lower than the Pencil of Solitude. We still won between 100 and 150,000 yen in each dungeon, but monster drops and meat were rare, and we didn't get anything else. We had tried going into one of my weight sets once. We found ourselves at the edge of a castle courtyard. Dungeon Entry Training Weights Mooks, 58 of 58 Midboss, 1 slash 1 unspawned Boss, 1 out of 1 unspawned We were mostly hidden behind a crumbling wall. Which was good, because in the middle of the broad, flat courtyard there were seven lizardmen. Each was at least two meters tall, and wore a metal breastplate. Each had a scimitar in their right hand and a flintlock pistol in their left. Analyze, I whispered. Weight reptilian. Way above your weight class. Level 21. Health 347 slash 347. Stamina 273 slash 273. I scanned the second one, just in case. Then I quickly hissed. Exit dungeon. Mom and Suyu were both nodding vigorously as we vanished back to reality. We decided we might try again later. Like when Suyu and I were both at least level 25. Even though they were weak, the various types of pencil enemies were still useful. Kobolds and goblins fought stupidly, except the bosses, just charging and directly attacking, and usually getting confused when Mom or Tsuyu took their weapons. Orcs were a bit smarter, and had some technique. Wolves, slimes, lizards, spiders, and bats were not intelligent, but posed their own interesting challenges. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, we went into the pencil I got for my birthday. It remained empty, but the pleasant internal weather and variety of terrain made it good for the sort of training we had been doing in Indora. Mom and I bought a cheap table, chairs, and bookshelf, and we moved them inside via inventory. Once in the dungeon, the furniture didn't move or vanish. We steadily built it up into kind of a hidden base and I started referring to it as our pencil of solitude. We couldn't bring ourselves to eat the orc meat, so we sold it to a butcher as scrap to make dog food. But the wolf and lizard meats were both delicious and unique, while the bad meat tasted like high-grade turkey. With the weaker enemies, Tsu and I had each only gained one more level, but our skills and attributes continued to go up at a reasonable pace. And I still hadn't beat Mizuno-san in the exam's rankings, but I was firmly entrenched in second place at Aldera. So the end of the year approached, and with it the customary festivities. You seriously bought my siblings each their own destiny? Tsuya said flatly, looking at me in disbelief. Are you trying to bribe them to like you? Maybe a bit, with your brother, I admitted. But actually, those are also partly for you and mom. You mentioned that they complained about not having games after they started coming here. And if they each have their own, mom won't have to put up with them arguing over what game they play on mine. And the truth comes out. Tsuya looked at me. You are just sick of them messing with your saved games and settings. I can't deny that either. I dropped my head in defeat. Then I looked up at her sideways. But it is Christmas. You never really struck me as Christian. Tsu noted. Mom and I aren't. I told her. But my grandma was, so I got used to celebrating it. Well, it's too late now, she relented. If I made them give them back, I'd be the bad guy. Does that mean you don't want the present I got you? I asked nervously. I never said that, she told me quickly. Relieved, I handed her the box before she could change her mind. She meticulously removed the paper and then opened it. It was a silver chain charm bracelet. There were five silver charms on it, a large frog with synthetic emerald chips for eyes, a smaller frog, a small salamander, a bear, and a squirrel. Me, my siblings, your mom, and you? 
she prompted. I nodded vigorously. I was looking for a charm for the other friend you mentioned, but I couldn't find a mongoose. Actually, that's just her name, Tsuyu told me. She looks somewhat like a snake, and her quirk lets her stop someone for a few seconds. Oh, I blinked at the irony. Well, maybe I can find one for your birthday. Thank you, Izuku, she said, buckling it on. You're welcome, Tsuchan. I thought we might be done, but then she opened her backpack and took out a clumsily wrapped gift. For me? I asked. She blushed slightly and nodded. It was a soft package, and inside was a t-shirt. It had a stylized picture of All Might, in a suit jacket with an upturned collar, and a tie with broad diagonal stripes. Next to the picture was the caption, No matter where you go, I am here. I've never seen you wear that one, so I thought you probably didn't have it, she explained. It's supposedly a reference to some old movie. It's great, Suchan, I told her. And no, I haven't seen this one before. Thank you? I hugged her, and she quickly returned it. Izuku, honey, mom said tentatively. There is something I want to talk to you about. It was New Year's Day, just after our shrine visit. We had met the Bakugas there, but Sue and her mother and siblings went to a different shrine. Their mom was only in town for a day, so they were spending it with her. Sure, mom. I tried to sound upbeat and confident for her. What is it? She closed the door behind me and walked into the living area of our apartment's main room. She sat down and I sat opposite her. It's a couple of things, but they are also sort of the same. She danced around the subject. I just nodded silently, not pressing her, trying not to show nerves and silently praising Gamer's mind. Still, I considered looking for an acting or poker face skill to help out. Intuition plus one, charisma plus one. Thanks. It's just, I was thinking, if we started to go into a new pencil every day, maybe two sometimes, or maybe even something harder, we might be able to make enough money to support ourselves. She didn't look at me as she said that. She felt guilty enough about the money we had made off the dungeons, of making money off her son's power. She was still a bit dubious of it, and also afraid what might happen if the government or a villain found out. So the suggestion was a bit of a surprise. Are we having money trouble, Mom? I asked carefully, but inside I was both panicking and calculating how much money we could make off a ten-pack of mechanical pencils. Ninety thousand was the lowest. No, she shook her head quickly. Your father actually got a good bonus and a raise. But I have just been thinking, if he and I were to get a divorce. Do you want a divorce, Mom? I suddenly realized where this was going. Your father and I agreed not to discuss it until you were at least in high school. She said, we would stay together until then for you. So you would have stability, considering. Considering I didn't have a quirk. I finished. And I didn't want to have to go back to work. I wanted to be there for you. She said, and if I'm being honest, I was afraid. Afraid of being truly, finally alone. Afraid I wouldn't be able to support us. Then she looked at me intently and added, Not that I intend for us to live off your power. I have been taking classes in design and materials, and brushing up on my sewing and math. I have put out some designs, and there's been some interest. I also have some costume ideas for you and see you, not that you'd probably be interested in them when UA has some of the top designers. Anyway, my point is that I potentially have a job lined up and I was just thinking of using dungeons as a supplement while I'm starting out, or in case things go wrong. Mom, I cut her off, seeing again where I got it from. I don't mind if we live off the gamer. I don't mind if you go back to work. And if you want to make your separation from dad into a full divorce, I'll support you all the way. Also, I'd like it a lot if you design my hero costume. Then I thought about it and said conspiratorially, in fact, I'm still not sure about this, Mom said softly. These are still just prototypes, made of normal materials. And remember what the weights were like. This book might be worse. 
I don't know. So you countered. The weights were a lower quality than the pencil of solitude, and yet the pencil was much easier. It seems like there is more than just quality and rank involved. I nodded. We'll check it out, Mom. And if it is dangerous, we will retreat. Same as before. Mom had put together test versions of the costume designs she had worked out with the two of us. They were made out of normal licra and cotton, but if we liked the design and the fit was good, we could turn them over to UA to be remade from armored fabrics and with some gadgets added. To make sure we didn't damage them in this test, we had also cleared the dungeons for the prototype costumes. They were about the same as the Pencil of Solitude in terms of challenge, except we were stronger now. My costume had been populated by skeletons, and Sue's was full of goblins and wolves. Sue's costume was like a dark green and very form-fitting wetsuit. It had a lighter green triangle downward from her shoulders to her breasts, and a line of the same color running from her palms, up the inside of her arms, and down her sides and legs to where it meshed into her integrated shoes, which looked somewhat like swim flippers. There was a cutout in the back of the cowl for her hair, and a pair of heavy swimmer's goggles. Since Sue didn't need them, they were parked up on her forehead. There was also a black harness, belt with some pouches, and gloves, the gloves and belt having the lighter green as accent colors. I don't like the goggles. Mom fussed over Tsu, partly as a perfectionist and partly as a delaying tactic. But they were the best I could find. And these parts. She ran her hands over the lines down Tsu's sides. My friend giggled slightly. In the final version they would have a thermal gel to help combat your cold issues. Mom concluded. You'd be able to control the temperature from controls. Maybe on gloves or the harness. My new costume was a blue-green shirt and pants, not quite so tight as Tsuyu's. It had a trio of white chevrons on the chest, biceps, and the outside of MYE thighs. There were also tan leather pauldrons, with matching gloves and work boots. The boots were steel-toed, and the gloves had a metal panel on the back of the hand. Finally, my costume also had a belt with pouches, but in white. And mine left my head uncovered. The fit is good. Mom checked me over. I left it a little loose, considering all the muscle you've put on over the last seven months, and since you are getting a bit taller, too. But otherwise, I think it looks good. What do you two think? It wasn't the first time she had asked that, but I knew she was nervous. It's really great, Inkolbasan. So you confirmed. I like the design, and the fit is good and easy to move around in. But I do agree about the goggles. Maybe the school will have something with night vision or polarization or something. I like it a lot too, Mom. I reassured her. Okay. She seemed mollified. Then she looked down at the table and sighed. If we are going to do this... On the table was the Kung Fu tome from my birthday. I had finally met the requirements for Wing Chun Quan and Tai Chi Quan. Both required 30 in agility, plus a total of 30 levels in other unarmed combat styles. Between basic karate and boxing, I had met the latter goal back in October. But I had just hit 30 agility before Christmas. That was when I decided we should try diving into the book before I used it. To see what a ranked up skill book did if anything. Analyze. I confirmed it again. Tao of Kung Fu. A master's tome, comparing and contrasting two martial arts styles. Durability, 22 35ths. Quality, 5 sevenths. Rank. I touched the book, and then hit decline with my other hand, when it prompted me to use the book. Create reflective dungeon. Dungeon entry Tao of Kung Fu. Students, 77 of 77. Assistant Masters, 2 halves unspawned. Master, 1 slash 1 unspawned. Izuku, Mom said nervously. The dungeon was a dojo. Bright, clean wooden panels and floor, with a padded mat in the center. Sunlight filtered in through the shoji walls. Wooden panels, etched with combat techniques, were hung on all sides. At the end opposite us was a door, leading further in. 
It wasn't just the number of potential enemies that had mom concerned. There were already 20 opponents in the room, 10 seated along either side wall. But unlike the previous dungeons, while they were obviously aware of us, they were not moving. As the dungeon was unique, so were the enemies. They were humanoid and human-sized, but they were made out of paper, folded paper like large origami dolls. Holding up a hand to tell mom and Sue to stay back, I walked carefully and deliberately over to the mat. One of the paper figures stood up and walked over to the opposite side of the mat. Analyze. Kung Fu Origami. A student of the dojo. Looking for a fair fight. Level 10. Health, 125. Stamina, 55. Key, 100. May I ask the rules? I asked, drawing on the knowledge my karate book had implanted in me. The student seemed to struggle for a moment, and then nodded. Yes or no questions only? I prompted. It gestured apologetically, but also nodded. May I use my skills? It nodded, then shook its head, then shrugged. Too generic? I can use some skills, but not others? It nodded. Can I use key skills? Again it repeated the uncertain gesture. Some of them got me another nodded. After a few minutes, I had the rules figured out. We could use skills that use stamina. We could use melee or personal enhancement key, but not ranged key. Psychic powers were prohibited, even telekinetic aura. Unarmed combat only, not that we brought any weapons. And the fights were one-on-one, -on -one, but Tsuyu and I could switch between rounds. And Tsuyu's tongue was allowed. Mom wouldn't participate, but took the first aid kit and some of the snacks to administer to whichever of us was resting. I stepped into the ring and was immediately interrupted. Dungeon quest alert. Dojo invasion. Defeat the students and masters of the dojo in martial arts matches according to their rules. Rewards. Bonus boss. Rare item drop. Failure penalties. Varies depending on reason for failure. Losing a match will not have additional penalties. Violating the rules will result in all remaining opponents attacking. Time limit must be completed in a single dungeon excursion. Accept decline? I hit accept almost immediately, worried that we might get swarmed if I did not. Then I moved up to the line on the mat, bowed, and then dropped into a fighting stance. Despite being higher level and having better technique, the first group of origami students went down pretty quickly. They were not terribly strong or tough, and they had very little mass, so it was easy to control the flow of battle. A solid hit would put them seriously off balance, and Tsuyu's kicks could send them flying. They also seemed to flutter whenever we took a moment to eat or drink. I wondered if they were jealous. When defeated, they bowed before vanishing and left the normal pile of money. All bills this time, no coins. But they also had not dropped anything else. Sue and I split them between us, five at a time. And then we took a short break and let mom worry over us, before proceeding to the next room. It was the same as the first room except one of the origami creatures was more detailed. It immediately turned to face us. Well done in making it here. It spoke, shocking me. However, my personal apprentices will be far less easily waylaid. To make it more fair, and to better test ourselves, we are willing to lift one restriction. Would you like to use your full range of key abilities? Or have access to your psionic personal enhancements? I frowned thoughtfully. I hadn't used any powers in the first room, at least not to fight. I had regenerated some health. What if I said neither? I asked. The construct tilted its head in surprise. That is acceptable, it said. May I ask why? Well, two reasons, I guess, I told it. First is that my partner doesn't have key or psionics, so it is more fair to her that way. And second, we are here for martial arts, so it feels better to focus on that. Very well. Its voice sounded impressed. I scanned them. 
The students were level 11, while the ones in the first room had all been level 10. Their health and stamina also suggested higher attributes. And the assistant master was level 12. I'll go first this time. So you told us, stepping towards the mat. Okay. I nodded to her. She stepped onto the mat and assumed her crouching, frog-like fighting stance. The first origami student approached Sayu. It bowed, and she inclined her head. It charged forward with a flat punch, only to find Sue hopping up and slightly forward. Her foot planted in its chest, and the lightweight opponent fluttered backwards. It kipped up and took a more defensive stance. Ajri didn't hesitate. Her tongue shot out, followed closely by a second kick. The third room was similar to the second, the students one level higher and a bit stronger. However, we took a moment to rest and to munch. So we were in good shape and took them down just as easily. The final room was somewhat different. Namely, the master of the dungeon looked human. He was also level 15 and noticeably tougher than his assistants. After we defeated the students, he made the mistake of inviting us to fight him, three on one and no holds barred. Mom immediately gestured towards the back wall. She pulled the plaque illustrating a certain kick to her. Unfortunately, the master's head was in the way. Tsuyu did not hesitate either, hitting him with her tongue. Key reinforcement, strength, telekinetic aura. I activated both. I darted forward, punching him in the chest. The master grimaced slightly, but I... Dash 25 health. Ouch. I shouted, feeling like I had possibly broken bones in my hand or forearm. Key and psionics do not naturally meld, young man. The master instructed as he blocked Sue's next kick. It is not enough to simply learn them, or even master them individually. Especially when focusing them on your strength or speed. What do I need to do? I asked and switched to key enhancement, endurance. How should I know? He shrugged. I'm not a telekinetic. I realized he had the voice of Master Ogwe, or at least something close. It didn't matter, but it distracted me for a moment, and his elbow nearly hammered my side. I intercepted with my arm at the last instant, but still took some damage and was pushed back. Before he could capitalize, the wooden instructions for a backhand strike smacked into his spine. Then Tsuyu slid in, trying to sweep his legs. He jumped over her. I fired a right cross at his stomach, and Tsuyu's tongue shot at his left temple. He blocked both, but lost a few HP and tumbled back. Mom, meanwhile, crept around the border of the room, getting the next plaque in line. I would prefer if you would stop that, young lady, he told her. This may be a temporary dimension, destined to be subsumed by your son's power, but I still feel like I will need to clean up around here later. Young lady? My mother giggled and blushed. What? I stopped and backed off. Don't fret, young man, he said kindly. I am not real. No native of these dungeons is. You are not killing me if you win or use the book. My intelligence is formed from fragments of yourself and the origin of your power. That's why I talk like a movie character. That's good, Sue so said, driving up with a double inverted heel kick. She connected firmly with his jaw, lifting him off the floor and taking off a good amount of HP. Yes, I agreed. I don't have to feel guilty about this. Chicago smash. I thrust my hand forward and ball of silvery key, larger than my head, shot forward with the speed of an arrow. It hit him in the chest, keeping him airborne. Then mom recovered, and the third plank smacked into the back of his head. That brought him down to 48 of his original 512 health. He landed and held up a hand. Hold, he requested hastily. I surrender. We stopped, but Sue and I both held our stances. Our dojo has been menaced recently by an ancient terror, he said, sounding less alive than when we were fighting. My students and I have been unable to defeat it or even drive it away, but I believe you may be able to do so. Will you save us? He smiled and winked, and then waved his hand in an innocent manner, 
the one that just happened to indicate the window that popped up. Final stage of Dojo Invasion Quest. Proceed, give up. I looked at Mom and Tsuyu. Both nodded. Proceed. Thank you, he said. The master walked over to the back wall, which had appeared solid. He pressed it, channeling his key into it, and a door opened. Then he disintegrated into flecks of paper, leaving behind more money and two very fantasy-like parchment scrolls. Before we could properly examine them, a roar shook the room. Mom took the money, like always, while I stored the scrolls. Something struck the back of the dojo, cracking the wall. We hurried out, before we could get trapped or crushed. Paper Dragon It may not breathe fire, obviously, but don't underestimate it. Level 20 Health 1000-1000 Stamina 300-300 Mana 300-300 Isn't this a bit much? Mom complained. No, I realized almost immediately. It's a puzzle, boss. Use the right trick, and it will be an easy fight. But we don't have fire, Tsuya noted. Not fire, I told them, materializing a third of my inventory. Two large jugs of sports drink, one gallon of water, and two 20-ounce sodas I was keeping in there. Broadway smash, I declared, using my telekinetic attack to fire them at the dragon as it swooped back around. The containers all exploded from the force of the impact. The liquid soaked into the paper, and the soda and sports drink made it sticky. The dragon tried to flap its wings as it went into a nosedive from the sudden increase in weight. But the parts of the left wing stuck together. Without it, the dragon crashed into the ground hard. The wet paper tore more easily, and it lost almost half of its HP. Chicago Smash the key orb easily punched through its soggy chest. Mom's worry faded into almost disappointment. So you walked over to the floundering monster and tore off its front right claw. With each second, the water spread, weakening it further. In the end, it took us less than a minute to dismantle it. Level up. Level 8. Attribute points, plus 7. Skill points, plus 3. Talent points, plus zero. Tao of Kung Fu complete. Defeated 20 enemies, rank plus. Defeated 40 enemies, rank plus. Defeated 60 enemies, rank plus. Defeated 80 enemies, rank plus. Defeated mid-boss, rank plus. Defeated mid-boss, rank plus. Defeated boss, rank plus. Defeated bonus boss, Rank plus. Level 1 cleared, rank plus. Mom and Tsuyu had also gained levels in last fight. And the dragon had dropped an item as well as money. The drop was a weapon, a tonfa made of purple heart, and reinforced with blackened titanium. The metal did more than just strengthen it, it also gave the club the look of stylized flames. It was a beautiful weapon with impressive stats, but none of us had a use for it so it went back into storage. That felt right like I might find a use, or user, for it later. Instead we were all focused on the other items. The book, and the two scrolls the master dropped. Tao of Kung Fu. A master's tome, comparing and contrasting two martial arts styles. Mysterious annotations provide additional tips and advice. Relic of Zero, KBD 5Z. Durability. 47 sixtieths. Quality 5 sevenths. Rank plus asterisk asterisk asterisk. Rank bonus. Added skill levels. Scroll of Kung Fu Fundamentals Tsuyu Ajui. A rare drop found only in true skill books from 0 v 1 Su. Acts as a skill book for the bonded individual. Durability 1 slash 1. Quality 0 slash 7 cannot be strengthened. The second scroll was the same, except with mom's name, and different garbled characters. When I analyzed the book again, that mix of kana, ramaji, digits, and other random characters had changed. Well, are we going to do this? Tsuya asked. 
We both looked at Mom. You aren't concerned at all? Mom countered. No, Su said without hesitation. I trust Izuku, and I trust his power. Besides, I really want to know what using a skill book feels like. Mom looked at the screen I had left up again. If you want, I'll go first, Mom, I told her. Izuku, are you sure? You bought this book from me, Mom, I reminded her. Before we dove in it, it didn't have this redacted information. So if I hadn't insisted we go into the dungeon, I would have used the book without ever seeing this. And it's not like it's the first time the gamer has held something back. I didn't have the quest tab right away, and there are still the three hidden ones. Hmm. <laughs> she shook her head. I'm letting you two show me up again. Okay, let's all do it together. We each touched our respective books. Then hit accept. Skill book used. Skill Kung Fu Fundamentals, LVL3 Unlocked. Skill Meditation, LVL3 Unlocked. Skill Wing Chun Quan, LVL2 Unlocked. Skill Tai Chi Quan, LVL2 Unlocked. Mom clutched her head slightly, while Tsu looked blankly at something only she could see. That was definitely something, Tsu Yu commented when she came back to reality. I know Kung Fu, Mom said with a hint of wonder. Are you both okay? I prompted in spite of their statements. I think so, Siyun nodded. I have a bit of a headache, Mom confided. Can I get you something? I asked. Let's count the money, she shook her head. Three and a half more months passed like the blink of an eye. Siyun's birthday, the new charms I got her, and the custom t-shirt Mom made her. Lots more training. A few more skill books but all just normal ones. And we had both gained one more level putting me at 9 and Tsuyu at 10. She teased me a bit about using another talent, but it was already the beginning of March by then, and I didn't want to spend the last bit of time trying to level up more new skills. Better to work at the ones I was comfortable with, and that I thought I was getting pretty good with. And it wasn't like she had spent her ninth level talent point yet. Now was the day. Tsu had come over for breakfast, and we had traveled together. We were standing before the gates of Yue. I held up a fist, and she bumped it. Chapter 10 Right. So before you start wondering about this later, I suppose I should tell you how key reinforcement and telekinetic aura work, and how they are different. Besides the obvious one is key and the other is TK. Both are personal, physical enhancement skills continuous ones, which means I turn them on, and I get a bonus to one or more physical attributes. And as soon as I turn them on, and periodically after that, I automatically spend a certain amount of energy. If I don't have enough energy, they shut off. I call that period the tick timer, thanks to those programming skills I ending up gaining. Starting with key reinforcement, since I got it first, it takes one energy and has a five second tick. In return, one physical attribute I choose gets a bonus equal to my key reinforcement skill level, plus half my determination attribute. If, for example, key reinforcement and determination were both 20, I could boost strength, agility, endurance, or quickness by 30 points. But only one of them. At least at first. You see, if my key rank goes up, key reinforcement gets better. For each additional key rank above one, I get an additional 10% to the bonus. It's not a lot, but it can add up. Also, at higher ranks, I can divide the bonus evenly, rounded down, between two or more attributes. At rank 2 I can split it between two scores, and three scores at rank 3. At rank 4 I can also choose to put the bonus into charisma, or part of it if I am splitting it up. At rank 7 I can split the bonus between four attributes and at rank 9 I can split it between all 5. Unfortunately, I can apply the bonus to wit, intuition, or luck. At least with the talents I can currently see. I had that last qualifier, because one of the talents I could see, but didn't qualify for yet, is Key Reinforcement Master, which limit breaks the skill and doubles the tick. And since I saw that Stamina Efficiency talent on Tsuya's list, 
I'm guessing there might be other ways to make the tick slower. Telekinetic Aura is the opposite side of the coin. It boosts all my physical attributes by a percent, and starts out with an even faster tick. But increasing the skill level slows the timer instead of increasing the bonus. The tick started at 1 second, but increases by half a second for each skill level. The timer also gets slower as my intuition rises. 25% slower at 50 plus slash peak human intuition, 50% slower at 100 plus slash superhuman, and 100% slower at 250 plus slash divine. Those aren't cumulative. Plus, there is a talent, focus, telekinetic aura, which changes the base tick to 1 second per skill level, and limit breaks the skill. So best case, 140 telekinetic aura skill and 250 intuition, and the tick would be almost 5 minutes. Since I already get back 2 energy every 10 minutes, I could almost leave it on at drive 1 indefinitely. Though I'm a long way off from that. As for what drive 1 means, TK Aura has 4 power levels called drives. Drive 1 gives me a 10% bonus times my telekinetic rank, and costs 1 energy per tick. Drive 2 is 20% times my telekinetic rank, but costs 3 energy per tick. Drive 3 is 30% times rank for 6, energy, and Drive 4 is 40% for 10. So just before the UA entrance exam, I could get 20% for strength, agility, endurance, and quickness. Or 80% if I decided to burn 10 energy for Drive 4. Oh, and I mentioned ranks a couple of times. Both Key and Psionics have ranks, which is basically the number of talents I have in them though the manual did imply there might be talents that are worth more than one rank, or other ways to gain ranks. Ranks are frequently a requirement for what talents I can buy. And like I mentioned before, many skills also get stronger, the higher the matching rank is. So you and I split up immediately. Our written exams were not only in different rooms, they were on opposite sides of the campus. See you at the practical, she said. The written exams were from 8 to noon, then a half-hour break for lunch. Then two more hours of written exams. Then another half-hour to rest, snack, and stretch, before the practical exam started at 3. The written exam rooms were also specially designed to do their best to prevent or detect cheating. With sheer variety of quirks out there, I didn't envy the proctors. Maybe they can hire Eraserhead to come in and look at us all through a big prism. I mused. Would his power even work indirectly? From a people-watching perspective, it was fascinating. There was a guy with tubes in the back of his legs, almost like the exhaust pipes in Ingenium's arms. A trio of girls who would have looked perfectly normal, except they were wearing the uniforms of the infamous Tokuwadai Heroin Preparatory School. And all kinds of uniforms, a dozen schools at least, many I didn't recognize. So much so that one girl stood out partly because she wasn't wearing a uniform. She had black jeans and a black, leather jacket, over a shirt so dark of a gray it almost could have been black. Even her backpack was black. She was slender, above average height, with short black hair, dark brown eyes, and lovely features that suggested a blend of Chinese and Caucasian heritage. She also carried herself like a weapon. Every martial arts skill I had seemed to be tingling in a combination of fear and anticipation, just looking at her. She wasn't the only foreign-looking girl. There was a blonde girl, with bright yet sharp green eyes. Not that those features were that uncommon in Japan these days, but her eyes and cheekbones spoke of British or maybe French heritage. On the other hand, she was wearing a uniform I recognized, so who is to say if she really was a gaijin? All that rubbernecking almost cost me. Because no matter how high your agility score or movement skills are, when the universe takes a look at your luck score and starts laughing you trip. And fall. Fast. Of course, with my health and physical resistance, it wouldn't kill me. It probably wouldn't even leave a mark. But was more than a little embarrassing. And why hadn't I hit the ground yet? I opened my eyes and realized I was floating and there was a hand in front of my face. I took it, and the owner helped me right myself. Then she clapped her hands, and gravity resumed. 
Sorry I used my quirk on you without asking. The girl, the very cute girl, said. But I figured you wouldn't want to miss the written exam with a broken nose. No, you are right. I agreed quickly. That would be bad. Thank you. I bowed deeply. Well, I'd better get to my exam room. She said kindly. Good luck. You too. I called after her. Then looking at my watch, I started jogging too. A tribute to the gamer and how hard we had studied, but the written exams were a piece of proverbial cake. There were a few questions that got me, but I would have been very surprised to learn I had scored under 90% on any of the tests. And Tsuyu and I were not able to meet for lunch, since they brought food in and didn't let us leave the classrooms. I guess they were concerned about cheaters exchanging notes, or maybe spying by other schools. Tsu and I had gotten warmed up with a set of light calisthenics before the buzzer went off. All of the applicants filtered into a giant auditorium. Along the way, I saw another person with an elderly uniform, a male uniform but the person had a feminine build, was wearing a thick cap and I didn't recognize him or her. I thought it might have been Mizuno, but that was probably just me hoping for another friendly face. Good afternoon, new listeners. A thin man with giant hair and a psyche black leather uniform exclaimed from the stage. Welcome to today's broadcast of the UA High Entrance Exam. You are the bravest of the brave for taking this shot. And whatever else happens, here's hoping you all come out alive. He gave us a big grin and a thumbs up. We all stared at him. Okay, tough crowd, the MC sighed. That's present Mike, I mumbled gleefully. The voice hero. He's a pro hero and a radio star. I listened to his show. Is everyone at UA a pro hero? Tsu asked. I'm sure all of you are wondering about today's playlist. Mike continued, not hearing us or not caring. The teachers are, I answered, but not all of the staff. You will be split up into seven groups, the pro hero explained, and undergoing a 10-minute combat test in one of our urban training environments. But first up on our countdown is that hit single, two ground rules, dot. He waited for a reaction, but other than me, everyone was silent. I was trying to keep it in, but between speculating about the exam and being so close to a famous pro hero. It looks like we are in different groups. I glanced from my card to Tsuyu's. I guess there was a good chance of that, but it makes me wonder if they are deliberately splitting up people from the same school or who might be friends. The first rule is, after we get done here, you have until 3.30 to get changed into your approved uniforms and gear, and get to your assigned area. Please note the approved part. You all submitted a list of what you wanted to wear and use, and you should have gotten back a yes or no response on each item. This is to prevent people from cheating and using items unrelated and unnecessary for their quirk. If, for example, he looked at a specific part of the crowd when he said that but I wasn't sure who exactly he was looking at. If your quirk is the power to control swords, and you submitted a set of swords on your request, and they were approved, you can bring and use them. But no swords beyond that. And if your quirk were a personal enhancement power based on what you eat, and you submitted a kitchen knife as part of your gear, but you don't actually need it, it would be rejected and you better not bring it with you. Anyone caught violating this rule will be immediately disqualified. Of course, if you can make items with your quirk, and you do so with the materials in the arena, that's just fine. Does that mean you can use items you find during the test? I pondered softly. Like just taking a street sign and using it as a club. Or using someone else's gear if they lose it? The second rule is that you can't attack or directly interfere with your fellow participants. If you deliberately attack someone else, or use your quirk to hinder them, that's an immediate disqualification. Helping others is okay, if you think it's a good idea. If you hit another listener accidentally, the first time you get a 10-point penalty. If it happens a second time, we have to assume that either they are not really accidents, or you don't have control over your quirk. Then, again, you will be disqualified. I noticed a few sour looks around me where they actually think about attacking other people. I mumbled under my breath. 
Or are they just not confident in their quirks? Though, in my mind I could almost see Kakin complaining about the rule, shouting that he would kill the other participants. Now, on to the main event, the MC announced. Your goal is simple, score the most points. Throughout each arena, you will find three types of robot villains. Minions which are weak and are worth one point. Lieutenants that are a bit stronger and are worth two points. And bosses that are not only strong, but are equipped with concussion missiles. Those are worth three points. Incapacitate a robot, and score that many points. Excuse me, sir. Someone a few rows down jumped to his feet, raising his hand. From his height and hair, I thought he was the guy with the pipes in his legs. Caller number one, you are on the air. Mike acknowledged him, and a spotlight focused on him. Thank you, the student said stiffly. There are four robot types on the handout we are given. It is unsightly for an establishment such as Yui to make such a mistake, whether it is by handing out old printouts, or not correct an error in them. Also, whoever is mumbling back there, please stop. You are disrupting things for the rest of us. Personally, I think jumping up shouting and interrupting the teacher is more distracting. Sue commented loudly. I thought his mumbling was rather insightful myself. Present Mike looked at me, nodding. Then he continued, And as for the first part of your request, you are getting ahead of me. There is a fourth type of robot, but they are not villains. They are obstacles. The tall guy looked suitably scolded, and sat down. Still, I clamped my hands over my mouth. That's right, true believers. The teacher shifted back to his on-air voice. The fourth type of robot is an obstacle. They are there to get in your way, but you can't fight them. That made a lot of the examinees start muttering. Think about it like this. Present Mike explained. Say you were a hero, about to rush into a burning building to save a child. But the child's mother panicked, is blocking your way. She's not a villain, she's not trying to do anything wrong. So you certainly can't knock her out and arrest her. You have to get around her, without hurting her or getting slowed down too much. Similarly, if inside the building, you found Kumpunk villain looting, you can't stop to arrest him, or the kid might die. The tone of the rumbling changed, but it didn't stop. That's what these obstacle robots are. They will try to hinder you, but you aren't supposed to fight them. If you defeat one, you will get no points. Even worse, if you go out of your way to attack one, you will lose half of your points. That caused a sharp intake of breath. Yup, he confirmed. Don't get me wrong. If the obstacle bot corners you, and you have literally no other way to escape besides fighting back, do it. You won't get any points, but you won't be penalized. But if you attack one, and the judges determine you had any other option, BPPPT. He blew a loud raspberry and flashed a thumbs down. So, probably safer not to, he concluded for us. There were a lot of agreeing nods. That's about it, he said. Take down the villains, score as many points as you can. Top 36 will make it into the hero course. That many? I burst out in surprise and a number of the other students turned to look at me. What do you mean? A boy with wild, purple hair and sleepy eyes protested. There are supposed to be 40 seats in the two hero course classes. Many eyes swiveled to look at Mike, but others looked at me, including present Mike. That's true, I agreed. But each year, there are on average six seats given to recommendations. There are three hero prep schools whose top respective students earn a recommendation admission to UA. Though sometimes those seats are free. Mike added, shifting his eyes to another part of the arena briefly. Either because those schools' faculties decide the top student isn't good enough, or because the top student turns it down. No prize for second place there. Right. I nodded. And usually there are seven or eight more students that get private recommendations though that tends to vary. Years with two or fewer private recommendations are fairly rare, and the highest number recorded was 12. Then they all have to take a simpler and early entrance exam. Like I said, six is the average number that passed the recommendation exam. You sure know your stuff, 2233. 
Mike noted, sounding slightly impressed. I couldn't help but blush a little. I'm not at liberty to say who the recommendations are, or what type they are. He continued, And to answer your previously whispered question 2233, you can indeed make use of whatever items you find within the combat zone, even if you are not altering it with your quirk. All right, if there are no other questions, then can I get a plus ultra? Plus, I shouted and petered out when I saw I was basically alone. Ultra. That was pathetic. Mike shook his head. You call yourselves UA candidates? Let's try this one more time. Can I get a plus ultra? Plus ultra. The majority of the students roared with me this time. Not bad. Smirked the loudest man in the world. Now you have 17 minutes to get changed and get to your arenas. See you after the exam? So you told me. Then she hopped up. I started to follow when I heard a loud ding. Quest alert. Record holder. Get the top score on the UA practical entrance exam. Rewards. Top score for this year. Bonus talent. Top score for the last decade. Bonus talent. Top score for all time. Bonus talent. Rewards are cumulative. Failure penalties. Being assigned to separate classes from Tsuyu Ajui, assuming you both pass. Time limit. It's a 10-minute exam. Accept decline. I didn't really read it through. I just hit accept and hurried out to the locker room. I gathered with the others outside Cityscape B. Most everyone was in physical education uniforms, but I was in my costume. I had registered it and had emptied my inventory just to be safe. My first aid kit, weights, and the tonfa were sitting on my bed back home. Even my phone was in the locker I had been assigned here, alongside my Aldera uniform. I saw the girl who had saved me and went to thank her again. But the tall boy intercepted me. I apologize for earlier. He bowed deeply. I was nervous, and I still am, as I'm sure you are. Still, I should not have called you out like that. Oh, uh, don't worry about it, I said. It's bad habit of mine, and I can't always control it. I had a friend who used to tell me to shut up when I got out of hand. I sighed, thinking about how much Kakan would have enjoyed this. A chance to blow stuff up and prove his superiority? This was right up his alley. Or at least, it would have been. But my other friend doesn't always stop me, I said. She says she learns a lot from listening to me. As present Mike San said, the taller guy agreed. Though I could not make out what you were saying. Anyway, I will not keep you anymore. We will be starting soon, after all, and we will be opponents then. Yes, I nodded. Good luck. I looked for the girl. No, not because she was cute. Not that she wasn't. I really did want to thank her again. But she was gone into the crowd. And with less than a minute left... I started moving towards the doors. Status, I whispered. Currently I had 320 energy, and TK Aura was at level 9. So it would take 1 energy every 5 seconds, or 120 for the whole 10 minutes. That would leave me with 200 energy for TK armor, or anything else I might need and feel safe using. It wasn't bad, but given this was my only chance to get into UA and keep my power, I caved. I put one more skill point into TK Aura, then flipped over to Talents. Without hesitating, I bought Focus, Telekinetic Aura. Talent Focus, Telekinetic Aura acquired. Overall Psionic Rank 3. Overall Telekinetic Rank 3. Skilled Telekinetic Aura is more efficient. Limit Break for Telekinetic Aura, Level 10 140. Dot. Now it would only cost 60 energy for the entire test, and I had a 30% bonus instead. Still, I couldn't bring myself to spend anything else. I went back to status, and left it open. That way I could monitor myself. And if I had to, I could more easily spend attribute and skill points during the test. All right. Present Mike shouted, as his face appeared in a screen mounted in the wall around the arena. Are we all ready to go? He asked. 
telekinetic aura drive one. I invoked, as some people yelled but most just mumbled. I can't hear you. Mike complained again. I said, are we all ready to go? Yeah. This time we all shouted, and I dropped into a sprinter's stance. Jet set run. I murmured as the doors started to open. As soon as there was a wide enough gap, I zoomed through. I locked onto the first two robots I saw, a pair of one-pointers. I took the head off one with a roundhouse kick, then pushed off it, driving the second one into a wall. That crushed its torso. For these ones at least, the armor was pretty weak, not much better than a couple layers of cooking foil. Deactivate jet set run. I said, seeing that the robots were close enough for the moment that I didn't need the extra boost to my speed. What are the rest of you waiting for? Mike complained. There are no countdowns in real life. Even as I reached the third robot, I heard the stomping of my opponent's feet, and then pipe legs darted past me with a speed I'm not sure I could have matched with every boost I had at the moment. The first two points in less than a second. A skeletal man in an ugly and ill-fitting yellow suit noted. Ingenium was faster to his first point. A gray, block-shaped person countered. Though slower to his second. Holy shit. President Mike hissed quietly, looking at a different arena's monitors. That got the attention of the teachers and other judges. How well they knew Yamada Hizashi varied from person to person but they all knew that his normal speaking voice was at least 10 decibels higher than your average individual. Even his whispers were still louder than most people spoke. For him to actually talk that softly was roughly the equivalent of all might shrieking like a little girl. What is it? A small, white, anthropomorphic rodent asked evenly. She just took out a dozen robots with one shot. Mike explained. For 17 points. Plus, she seriously cracked the outer wall. How? More than one of the watchers demanded. Hizashi wound the video back. They watched as the brunette took out one robot, and then tore a washer out of it. She flipped the washer into the air. When it came down, she flicked it. With a sonic boom, it blasted down the street, clearing it of robots. I told you it wasn't fair to let her skip the recommendation for the normal exam, Nizu. A voluptuous woman in a skin-tight costume told the rodent. I personally agree with you, Narumi-chan. Principal Niza told Midnight. But it is her choice, according to the rules. The seat in the hero class would be hers either way. Assuming there were no issue with her written exam. This water user in Arena D is quite impressive as well. The being in the spacesuit offered. I darted around the corner and saw an interesting sight. A person with a black hooded sweater and jeans. The hood was pulled up, obscuring their face. I recognized the all-black wardrobe and the body shape as one of the girls I had noticed this morning. She had just changed her leather for the hoodie. She was dancing through a group of one and two pointers. Her skill was amazing, and her strikes had incredible precision. Her fingers plunged between the gaps in the robot's armor, tearing wires and breaking servos but one of the two-pointers had gotten behind her. With the hood up, she couldn't have seen it. I raced forward. An axe kick took off its scorpion-like tail. The two-pointers had much heavier armor, but my strength was still enough to break through it. I then plunged the tip of the tail into its head. The girl turned on me, and I saw a black mask covering her face from the nose down. But her eyes were angry, and her fingers flashed. I panicked, though it was at least partially exaggerated. I swung my arms around, hitting the skills tab, scrolling down the window, and putting two points each into American Sign Language and Japanese Sign Language. Recalling her gestures, she was using the latter, and had basically said, backslash that was mine, I had it slash. Backslash I, sorry slash, I answered clumsily, backslash I not mean kill steal slash. Her eyes widened in surprise, and she signed more slowly, backslash I can hear, just not speak, slash. Oh, that's easier. I sighed in relief. Though inwardly I was kicking myself a bit for immediately spending points when confronted by an angry woman. Not that I probably wouldn't do it again. I'm sorry. 
I told her with a bow. I didn't mean to kill Steele. I thought you couldn't see it with your hood up like that, and I didn't want you to get hurt. Here. I saw something, and darted to a side street. I came back a second later, dragging a pair of three-pointers. I had bumped up to drive three for a moment, and crushed their launchers. But the bots were still functional. I planted them in front of her, and then hammered their legs into the cement, so they could not retreat or outmaneuver her. Please take these instead, I told her, then mumbled drive one, before I had to pay for drive three again. She stared at me in confusion, but I saluted her, and ran off to find more targets. As I did, I saw her jump at the first boss. How interesting, the ill-looking man commented. What is it, All Might? The blocky teacher asked. Not only did he rescue her, Tashinori Yagi pointed at the boy with tea fuzzy green hair, but he brought her targets to make up for taking her points. And what's more, look. The teachers watched as the black-haired, black-clothed girl approached the blonde girl in red, with a trio of swords floating around her. She defeated the fourth two-pointer menacing the blonde. Then with a flash of ASL, and some gestures after she realized the other young woman didn't sign, the two went back to back, and began tearing through a robots at a faster and safer clip. He didn't just save her, he inspired her. Midnight purred, impressed. And maybe something else that wasn't appropriate considering the green-haired lad's age and position as her potential student. We may have a truly high-scoring year, Niza remarked. Most interesting, All Might said thoughtfully. Look out! I shouted, and kicked away the missile targeting the guy with tape coming out of his elbows. Then I smashed into the boss, turning it around so it couldn't shoot at him again. All yours, I told him, as I started to sprint away. Thanks, he called out in surprise. Pay it forward, I yelled back. I was at 72 points. I hoped. It might have been more. After the girl in black, I tried to damage attackers and leave them, so I wasn't kill-stealing. But if I had gone too far, my count might have been higher. I knew I shouldn't have been doing that, but I couldn't help it. I wanted to be a real hero, someone who helped others. Not a guy who only looked out for himself. Or worse, let others do the work, only to swoop in and take the glory. There were about three minutes left, so I would probably be able to get over 90. Even though the robot villains were starting to thin out. Thankfully, I had not run into the obstacle bot yet. Two minutes left, boss man, Hizashi announced. Unleash the executors. Niza's face lit up in a worrying manner. I had found and defeated another unoccupied two-pointer, when the whole arena shook. Is it a special emergency scenario? I wondered to no one in particular. Then I saw the facade of a building crumble the next street over. I heard screams of terror and saw other examinees pouring into the alleys. I went the opposite way, a combination of worry and curiosity pulling me into the emptying street. They call that an obstacle? A boy, shorter than me by almost a head and with weirdly round purple hair shrieked as he ran by. But I could appreciate his statement when I cleared the alley. It was the same shape as the printout, but the zero-pointer was taller than many of the buildings. It barely fit in the street, and knocked free chunks of wood and stone every time it moved. The road was now filled with rubble. I saw Pipe Guy, frozen in terror, and Tape Guy struggling not to run. I wasn't sure why they weren't evading, retreating. Until I saw. The girl who had floated me this morning was in the path of the robot. Her legs were trapped by the debris it had created, and she was at most two seconds away from being stepped on. My brain jumped straight to third gear. I calculated how fast I could get there now. How fast I could get there if I spent everything I had. It still wasn't enough. I could get to her, but getting her free would either take too long, getting both of us crushed. Or I could do it the quick way and destroy her leg. With plus one, intuition plus one, mathematics, basic skill improved, LVL2, mathematics, advanced skill improved. LVL2. Skill physics, basic, LVL1 unlocked. I pushed my brain harder. 
If I could get her out in time, could I also stop the robot? Yes, that was possible. It would cost me. But I couldn't let her be crushed. I ran the calculations one more time, then started muttering as fast as I could and running as fast as I could. Jet set run. TK Aura drive 4. Key reinforcement quickness. Add 19 to strength. Add 6 to quickness. Add 12 to determination. Add 11 to key reinforcement. By key apprentice dot. Talent key apprentice acquired. Overall key rank, 2. Skill key regeneration upgraded to key healing. Skill key diagnosis available. Skill key projection split into key blast and key slice dot. 49 steps to go. The bonus from the second key rank was only a few more points, but I wanted healing as a backup. Dash 2 health. I shot forward, still slower than Pipe Guy had been, but not by much. Dash 2 health. 47 steps to go. Each step, pain shot up my legs, only to be quelled by Gamer's body. My energy was draining fast. I didn't dare activate key healing for myself, in case my calculations were wrong and I needed the energy for my backup. Finally, I hit the last step and said, Key reinforcement, strength. Then I jumped. I wasn't aiming for the head. There was too much of a chance it would just tear off. I was aiming for the torso, halfway between what I guessed was its center of mass and its shoulders. High enough to have a good leverage, but not so high that it was thinning and I might break through. I drew back my right arm. Mentally, I imagined pushing all the TK aura and key into the limb. The blazing life of the key and the cool intellect of the psions. They might not want to work together, might cost me. But they would do it. Minnesota smash! I roared, punching as hard as I could. I threw a bit of regular telekinesis into my body, adding to my momentum, trying to make up for the lack of purchase. Dash 120 health. Status ailment, broken arm. My hand pierced the steel plate, and the armor around the hole rippled like water. The mechanical and electronic bits underneath were powdered by the force. The strain on me was too much. My health plummeted below half, dipping below 25%. Two of my finger bones snapped, as did one in my hand and another in my wrist. Plus I think I dislocated my shoulder. Also both tibias, previously supported by gamer's body, cracked but did not fully break. The robot teetered. It didn't seem to be functional, but despite the power I had hit it with, I had been a bit lacking in mass. It wasn't falling yet, and might go either way. Broadway smash! I grabbed all the broken bits inside the robot with my telekinesis, and shot them away from me with every scrap of energy I had left. It worked, sort of. The robot was now falling back. Away from the girl. Unfortunately, using telekinetic attack basically locked me in place relative to the robot. As it was forced away, I stayed still for half a heartbeat. Then gravity kicked in. So I was falling. From roughly 40 meters up. With my legs damaged, I knew they would break or even shatter if I tried to land on them. I twisted around, trying to lead with my good left arm. When it hit, I would try to both absorb the shock by pulling my arm back and roll into the fall. 15 meters. 5 meters. Had to time this just right. Dash 10 health. As the pavement drew painfully close, I was suddenly slapped in the face and stopped falling. The girl had jumped at me and was tumbling past. I managed to grab her leg so she didn't hit the ground either. I saw that the rubble she had been trapped under was now floating too. Sorry. She was crying and laughing at the same time. I was aiming to touch your chest, but my timing was off. That's okay. I laughed too, lowering her to the ground. She stood up, pulled me the rest of the way down. Then she clapped her hands, and I dropped the last centimeter, and immediately sat down. Are you hurt? I asked her. My leg was clamped a bit, she said, standing gingerly, but I don't think it's broken. What about you? I looked at the remains of the fallen robot. 
at what was likely the end of my dream, or at least of my power. I'm fine. I lied. Nothing a good night's sleep won't fix. I'll be the judge of that, a gentle, slightly wavering voice said behind me. A tiny, elderly woman shuffled over to me, a handful of disturbed students on her wake. You are recovery girl. I started to geek out, but she shut me up by casually stuffing two gummies into my mouth. I could tell by the taste that they were not just candy, but rather the multivitamin type. Hmm. Recovery girl checked me over insistently but gently. Dislocated right arm with five broken bones. I missed one? I knew my TK aura wasn't really a diagnostic tool, but... Or had one more broken after I was out of power and couldn't detect it? My lack of energy was making it hard to keep my eyes open, but adrenaline, and now the gummies, helped. Both tibias and one femur have multiple cracks but no clear break. Pucker up, young man. She leaned in and gave me a big, sloppy kiss. My body felt warm and itchy, and I had one last thought before passing out. I'm really glad my first kiss was with Siu. I woke up, and my still open status screen told me it was after 7. My health was back up to 80%, but my energy was lower than it should have been. Maybe a side effect of Recovery Girl's power? Key regeneration. I said as softly as I could. You are awake already? Recovery girl said, and I turned to face her. I noticed you were healing faster than usual, even for my power, but this is a surprise. My TK can pull my body back to the proper shape, I told her, and stimulate the cells to recover and reconnect. Hmm. <laughs> she looked at me again suspiciously. Then she shrugged and got up. I suppose that explains what you said about only needing a good night's sleep. She took out the four I hadn't even noticed, and continued. But you should still make sure to get a good meal as well. Just having vitamins and nutrient drip won't properly replenish what your body needs. I will, I reassured her. Then I suppose you are free to go, she told me. Your friend was here until about a half an hour ago. Then she said she had to leave and that you would know why. She has to help take care of her siblings. I nodded. Not using my right arm, I swung my legs out off the bed. They didn't hurt anymore. My arm, on the other hand, still ached, and I still had the negative status that it was broken. I guessed it would need the full night's sleep to get rid of it. As I started to leave, Recovery Girl's voice stopped me. Why did you do it, son? She asked gently. Save the girl, hurt yourself? In retrospect, it seems silly, I admitted. There's no way the school would actually kill an exam participant, right? Except the counter-argument is that with all of those quirks in use, all of that energy and dust and whatever flying around, they could easily have lost control of the robot. Or the idiot controlling it got too caught up in the moment and didn't notice the girl. Recovery girl grumbled. A chew. Principal Niza sneezed, and suddenly felt guilty. He looked across the table at a dejected and brow-beaten present Mike. Thank you again, Hisashi, for taking the heat from Recovery Girl, the rodent said cautiously. Just remember that when it is time to talk raises, boss man, the hero groaned. That could be, too, I agreed. All I knew was that in that moment, she was going to die, and I had to do something. I tried to do the math in my head. I could reach her, but couldn't get her out in time. Not without probably tearing her foot off. But you know how if you bump the bottom of a glass, it just slides, but if you bump the top it tips over. I knew I could do that, if I hit the robot in the right spot. I was afraid the head was just come off, so I went for the body. I picked a spot about the center of mass, but not so high that I would lose too much horizontal speed in my jump. Even then, it almost wasn't enough, and I had to push it away with what telekinesis I had left. You sound like him, she noted. Normally I would scold you now, but it seems like you thought it out well. And you have already been penalized for this. My head sank. Thank you for treating me, I told her. Then I left. Time to go home. To tell mom what had happened. That I had probably failed. 
Chapter 11 I left the nurse's office and went back to the locker room. It was already empty, naturally. I changed slowly, my arm still ginger. I didn't bother to check my phone. I would talk to mom when I got home and called to see you then, too. I doubted anyone else had called me. When I got home, mom was waiting. No surprise there. She had certainly been called by Yue and had probably been watching to see you and I on the party tab, too. Are you all right, Izuka honey? She asked gently, but didn't fuss over me. I will be in the morning. I told her. How did you get hurt so badly? She asked a little more anxiously. When the school called and said you were in the nurse's office, unconscious, I checked. You were down quite a bit. But you recovered so fast. That was recovery girl's power. I noted. Though I think it interacted with my key regan. No, key healing now, in some way. Because my energy is lower than it should be. And I didn't get hurt. I hurt myself. I told her. About the written exams and how easy they were. The rules for the practical. A quick rundown of the highlights leading up to the end. About the girl I owed being in danger. Spending most of my points. Saving her, even though using key and psionics together had a nasty backlash. And punching a hundred tons of machine, covered by reinforced steel, probably didn't help either. I concluded. After that, recovery girl came in. She diagnosed me, which was kind of amazing. Then she used her power, and it knocked me out. It was the right thing to do, Mom told me. Saving that girl. If the school doesn't see that, I'll give them a piece of my mind. It's not that simple, Mom. I shook my head. Rules are there for a reason, right? Sometimes they are right, and sometimes they are wrong, and sometimes they seem wrong if you don't know the whole story. But whatever way, if you break them, you have to be ready to deal with the consequences. Like Recovery Girl told me, the judges will decide if there was no other choice, or if there was something else I could have done, or even if the robot just would have missed her. And what will you do if they rule against you? She prompted. It depends, I told her. I counted 77 points, which from what I saw was probably enough. But if they take half, I'll only have 38 points. If the cutoff ends up being 35, I'll be fine. If it is 40, then I won't make it. Well, if you really did that well on the written part, she said thoughtfully, then you can still get into the general education course. And then you can work your way back into the hero course. I guess that depends on how losing the gamer works out, I told her. Izuku, what are you talking about? She asked sharply. Didn't I? No, I deliberately didn't at first. I remembered. And then I just never really thought of it again. Quests. I scrolled down. Then swiveled the screen around so she could see the path of a hero. There were just under seven days left on the timer. What does that mean? Mom pressed. I don't know. I admitted. Even Analyze won't tell me anything more. At the very least, the loss of the gamer... Gamer's mind and body, inventory, quests, party. The ability to see my stats and control how my points are spent. For you too, too. And probably analyze too, that's always in the windows. Beyond that? If I'm lucky, I might get to keep all the talents and skills I already have. In that case, getting into the hero class would be possible. Maybe even easy. Worst case scenario. I suddenly revert to being what I was ten months ago. Smart, but not this smart or knowledgeable. Weak. Powerless. But I'll still find a way back to the hero course. Oh, honey. Mom pulled me into a hug. Can we eat? I told her softly. I'm really hungry, and might as well take advantage of gamer's body. I left the last five words unsaid. While I still have it. After dinner... I fell into bed. Well, cleaned my bed off, and then fell into it. I took my phone out, and hit the second number on my call list. Moshi Moshi Izuka Kun, Tsuyu answered. Moshi Moshi Tsuchan, I said softly. I heard some of what you did in the practical, she said. 
a bunch of the girls from your group were talking about it. It sounded pretty amazing. Oh, not really, I protested weakly. So, now that we are both UA students, I could hear the smirk in her voice. I believe there was a conversation we need to have. Maybe instead of training tomorrow, we could go to a nice cafe. Maybe a movie. Maybe my room. I broke. I had held it in with mom. But thinking back to what I had told to see you, about how hard it would be, going back to being the old me, I started to cry. I was joking. See you said quickly but sincerely. I love you as a friend. And you are definitely cute and sexy. But I don't think I'm in love with you. Maybe someday. Soon. But you were right. We need to focus on UA for now. We might have gotten in, but it will get harder from here. I was sobbing harder, but also laughing. That's not it, I told her. In fact, I might have taken you up on that, because I might not have a chance later. Izuku? Siya sounded worried. I attacked the zero pointer. I told her what had happened during the practical. How many points did you get, Siya? I asked after I finished. Um, about 60, I think, she answered softly. So 38 could be pretty low, I said. If your 60 is in the top 10, I might be okay. But if it is only top 20, or even top 15, I probably won't make it. What will you do then? She asked. Like I told my mom, I answered. If I still make it into the general studies, I will work as hard as I have to, to get into the hero course. Without your power? She prompted softly. However the loss of the gamer leaves me, I said firmly. Okay, she said, and I'll help however I can. Well, maybe we could still go out tomorrow, I said. Get lunch and just hang out. I think I need a break. Even if only a short one. And even if she did just dump me, I'd like to spend it with my best friend. That sounds good to me, she said. So how did your practical exam go? I asked. Well, it was a little tough at first. There was this lightning user who blasted all the bots near the entrance. But once I moved further in, I was able to rack up a decent score. Did you see any other interesting quirks? I asked, reaching for my notebook. Hearing her mention in electrokinetic reminded me I should take some notes about what I saw. Well, there was a guy who was all metal. He seemed pretty strong, too. But I guess if I weighed a couple hundred kilos half the time, I'd be pretty strong, too. And another boy who shot a golden sparkly beam out of his stomach that crushed the robots. What about you? I saw the girl present Mike called out. I said. She had three swords flying around her, cutting up the robots. And that guy who called me out. He was really fast. I think he might be related to Ingenium. We talked for a few more hours, and then planned where we would meet for lunch. So now what? Tsuyu asked as we left the pizza place. We had met up at the agreed restaurant after her Saturday classes. I was wearing jeans and a button-up shirt. And when Tsuyu had arrived, she was wearing a blue sundress and a lightweight, pale yellow jacket. She had taken the time to change before meeting me. And she looked very good. I was thinking something fun for a while. I told her. And then we could go back to my place and find a pencil. Or maybe something a bit more challenging. And clear the dungeon. Are you sure about that? She countered gently. Yes, I said firmly. I'm going to get as strong as I can this week. Either to get ready for the hero course. Or for the other. Okay, she smiled slightly. So what did you mean by something fun? Well, movies are probably out, I said. Did you have any ideas? What about the arcade? She decided after considering it for a moment. I haven't been to the arcade since. I trailed off. I hadn't been there since Kakin and his cronies made it their main after-school hangout, back at the end of elementary school. Part of me still was nervous about it, but then I had to ask myself why. Well, it's been too long. I decided. Let's go. She nodded. It was only a short walk to the arcade. But as we arrived, 
an unfortunately familiar group was leaving, and Longfingers and his gang looked particularly annoyed. His face brightened sadistically when he saw me. That sparky bitch might have ruined our day, he said to his minions, but it looks like we can still have some fun. Ain't that right, little Deku? We just want to go in, I told him flatly. We? What's that? Oh, look, boys, Deku's got a little girlfriend. He looked over me at Tsuyu, who did not protest the label he placed on her. They moved to surround us. I glanced at Tsuyu, and then we slipped by them like they weren't even there. Before we could get inside, Longfingers grabbed Sue's arm. Come one, sweetie, he crooned. You can do better than this quirkless nerd. Even if that were remotely true, she croaked angrily. You wouldn't even begin to qualify as better than Izuku. His fingers grew and tightened. Listen, bitch, I'm giving you a chance because you got a smoking body and can probably do some interesting things with those big hands. But with that ugly face you won't do much better than da. My uppercut passed within a millimeter of his face. I'd like to think the force of the punch was at least part of what made him teeter back and fall on his butt. More likely it was just a combination of fear and surprise. He looked up at me in growing anger, but then his eyes suddenly widened in fear. You can say what you like to me, I told him coldly. In three weeks I'll be in UA, and you will go wherever you are going to school, if you are staying in school, and I will never have to see or think about you again. But you insult see you again, and you will wish you hadn't. He gathered himself up, scowling. I thought he might try to attack me. His cronies also tensed. Then the lights in the front of the arcade flickered. I heard the crackling of electric sparks. We all turned to look, and the bullies blanched. There was a girl standing in the arcade's entrance. She was about my height, maybe a hair shorter. She had short brown hair, brown eyes, and pretty, somewhat refined features. She had a slender build, and was wearing a pair of green dockers, a black t-shirt with three hearts just under the collar, and a brown ball cap and she was flipping a token across her fingers, static jumping off with each rotation. You'll pay for this on Monday, you damn Deku! Longfingers shouted as the three of them ran off. Stupid jerks! The electrokinetic frowned. Oh, you were from the the practical exam, Tsuyu realized. That Biribiri girl. The girl flinched and glared at Tsuyu. Don't call me that, Froggy. Fine, if you don't call me Froggy, Tsuyu said. It's Froppy. Tsu? I looked at her, confused. That's my hero name, she told me. I've had it since grade school. And why did that guy keep calling you Deku? That's not your name? The Biribiri girl prompted, a bit confused. No. I smiled sadly. For a long time it seemed like I was powerless, so my friend used to call me Deku. Because like the wooden doll... He said I wasn't worth much and couldn't do anything of my own. Doesn't sound like a very good friend, the brunette said sharply. Was that Katsuki-san? Tsuya asked softly. I nodded. Okay, the other girl asked. Then what is your name? Isn't it common courtesy to introduce yourself first? Tsuya countered before I could say anything. The brunette grimaced, but nodded. I'm Masaka Mikoto she said, and then looked at Tsu expectantly. I'm Azuri Tsuyu, but I guess you can call me Tsuyu. I'm Midoriya Izuku. Wait. I held up my hand, staring at her in disbelief. You turned down the recommendation? Yup, Misaka-san confirmed, and then took a draw off her juice. After silently confirming it with Tsuyu, we had spent the last few hours hanging out with the slender girl. It might have been not a date, but I wasn't stupid. Hanging out with another girl without getting Tsuyu's buy-in was a sure fire way to turn it from not a date to never going to be a date. And I wasn't looking to close that door. Fortunately, Tsuyu had been almost as curious as I was. Even as we played various games, we discussed the entrance exam. Misaka-san was a bit amazed when she heard I was the idiot who attacked the zero-pointer affirming Tsu's statement that I was a source of gossip amongst the female participants. 
and maybe the male ones, too, since I had been unconscious while they were changing and leaving. Then Misaka-san dropped her own bombshell. Why? I pressed. Do you know how many of the top heroines came from Tokuwadai? She asked with a scowl. Twenty-two of the top fifty here in Japan. I answered easily. And forty-two of the top one hundred worldwide. The brunette blinked in surprise, and Tsuyu chuckled. Right. Misaka-sen finally confirmed, then added in a mock authoritative voice. And for the past twenty-five years, Tokawadai's top student has been granted a recommendation to Yue. Then she stopped and returned to her regular tone. That's been basically their selling point while I was going there. But let's see if you know this, Midoriya-san. How many of those forty-two top heroines were from the recommendations? I glanced at Tsuyu, who shrugged and then said, I don't know. Three, Misaka-san answered sharply. And there are two more active heroines that don't make the list. Though, admittedly, Mount Lady just started a year ago. I blinked. For a couple of reasons, but mainly both the low number and the fact that the seeming rough Mount Lady had come from prim and proper Tokawadai. Then again, Misaka-san didn't seem particularly high class either, wearing pants in an arcade sipping fruit punch through a straw. If only one in five made it, Tsuya asked. What happened to the other twenty? Misaka-san smirked at that. Well, two years ago and nine years ago, they didn't give out the recommendation. And of course, the one from last year is getting ready to start her second year, and the one from three years ago just graduated. Four others made it, but one was killed in action, and the three oldest have retired. But the last twelve? Almost half of the total? Seven failed. Flunked out, were expelled, or transferred into the general studies or support classes. And the last five quit and got married within a year of graduating. Something about the way she said that last part caught my attention. Quirk marriages? I hissed softly. Of course not, she said. There is no way that Tokawadai would be sending its best and brightest off to be brood Maris. But her flat, sarcastic tone said she didn't believe her own denial. Anyway, Misaka-san shook out her shoulders. With odds like that, is it a shock I decided I'd rather try the normal entrance exam? I guess not, Tsuya nodded. Besides, the brunette said pointedly, I didn't want some cakewalk. I wanted to prove that I really deserved to be at UA. Tsu and I exchanged knowing looks. Then I sombered and asked the question I had been dreading. How many points do you think you got, Misaka-san? She started to grin. Then she looked at me and realized why I was asking. I'm not exactly sure, she said gently. My first shot blew them away before I could get a count, but I think at least 90. I sighed, my likely 38 points looking even smaller. We got back to my place and stopped outside the door. Even though we were still planning to train until Tsu had to pick up her siblings, there was something I wanted to say. Well, say might not be right. I had a lot of fun today, I told her. Izuku? I brought my hand up to gently cup her face. I moved in slowly, hoping my intentions were clear and she had time to stop me. The kiss was short, but really nice. I know. I panicked almost as soon as I pulled back. You said you wanted to go slow like I did and weren't sure how you felt. And I agree and feel the same. But this just felt... Right. She agreed softly. Then in her normal voice told me. Well, I guess something like this might not be too bad. Every once in a while. I got home from school the next Friday. My heart hammering harder with each step. The three of us had been working really hard clearing full pack of pens, plus my mom's favorite frying pan. It hadn't been enough for any of us to level up. But we had all grown stronger. My mom almost looked as fit as midnight. When I entered our apartment, mom was waiting. She was holding a letter. A letter with UA seal on it. I took it from her. Izuku, honey, do you want me to be with you when you open it? No, mom. I told her unsteadily. I want to do it alone. 
I went into my room and closed the door. Quests I looked at the two open quests. I had just over two hours until the path of a hero ran out. Part of me was tempted to let it. To see what would happen, maybe find out that way. I slid open the envelope and pulled out a single sheet of paper. Midoriya Izuka-san The results of your UA entrance exams are as follows. Written exam, 92.4% overall. Practical exam, 36 points. We regret to inform you that the cutoff point for the hero course was 43 points. Due to your excellent grade on the written exam, we are pleased to offer you a position in the general education course. With your displayed abilities, it is entirely possible you will be able to convert to the hero course at a later date. Sincerely, Principal Nizu and the rest of the UA staff. I turned to look, and the two quests were both flashing large, red failed signs. The screen cracked. It flaked away. I began panting in fear and despair. After less than a second, it was gone. I felt pain. My muscles shrinking. My tendons tightening. My brain felt too full, like it was leaking. I looked at my monitor and saw my reflection. Small. Weak. I bolted upright in bed, throwing my top sheet into the wall. I grabbed my chest trying to slow my anxious heart. I looked at my alarm. 3.27, almost two hours before I would have normally gotten up. The nightmare shook me and confused me. How could my dreamscape replace my mom with midnight of all heroes? But I would find out today. Just a day of class and then. I went to get a glass of water before I tried to fall back asleep. I didn't think I would rest easy. Are you sure you want us both here? My mom, my real, normal-looking mom, asked. Definitely, I said. Then I looked away from the envelope at Tsuyu. Are you sure you wouldn't rather go look at your own acceptance letter? I asked her. No. Izuku, mom looked at me. Don't you want to spend your remaining points? No, I said. There is a better chance than not that it would be a waste and it would feel like I am giving up. I get that, Sue agreed. Okay, Mom nodded. I ripped open the envelope. Unlike my dream, there wasn't just a letter. Instead, a small disc popped out and fell to the table. After it stopped moving, it lit up. Greetings. I am here as a hologram. All Might appeared above the projector, and we all blinked. Wait, All Might? I tried not to wig out. This is from Yue, isn't it? Are you surprised? The recording asked. You see, I didn't just come here to fight villains. No, I am the newest teacher at Yue. And as the newest teacher, it falls to me to record these results messages. Virtual All Might picked up a sheet of paper. Participant 2233 Midoriya Izuku. He read, then his dark eyes brightened. Aha! That young man. Well, for your results. On the written exams, you scored a stellar 98.3% overall. The second highest score on the written test. That alone guarantees you a spot at UA. The only question is which course you will be in. On the practical exam, you scored 77 villain points. The third best score of the test, and under normal circumstances, it would be more than enough to earn you a place in the hero course. All Might looked down, almost sadly. Mom and Sue grabbed my arms. Except that you deliberately attacked the zero-point obstacle and did a very impressive job of it. I'm not sure I could have done as well when I was your... Rambling? No, I'm not. Wait, I have how many of these things to do? The symbol of peace looked a bit embarrassed and continued. You were warned that attacking the obstacle robot would cost you half of your points. That should put you at 38 points. And the 36th place finisher scored 40 points. Their grips became almost painful. Unlike my dream, I had been too afraid to have my screen up. But that qualifier had me holding on to it like a life preserver. Should. I think there is something else you need to see, the projection said. Then the image changed. 
Not that I want to give up my position, Pipe Guy was saying to Cementas. But if I could give him a few of my points and still pass, such heroics should not be overlooked. The scene shifted again. Backslash after he took a two-pointer from me, slash the silent girl signed, though they had added subtitles. Not that I needed them, I had been watching signing videos while doing physical training. Backslash, but then he brought me two three-pointers instead. So it would only be fair for you to give him those four points. Slash. And again. Look, the guy saved me. The Tate guy told the teacher I didn't recognize. There has to be something you can do. And then I saw present Mike. He opened the door to reveal the girl I had saved. Hello, listener, Mike said. What can I do for you? About that boy, she said softly. The one with the messy green hair and freckles. You called him 2233 in the intro. He saved me. He knew it would cost him, maybe even not let him make it in, but he did it anyway. It's not fair. So please, could you give him my points? I mean, it would be nice if the two of us could split my points and both make it on. Air in. But if not, please just give them to him. I wouldn't be here without him. He deserves to be a hero more. Sorry, loyal listener. Mike said more quietly than normal. But that's just not possible. Still, keep your ears peeled. The big announcement might not be what you are thinking. Then it shifted back to all might. Young man, Yue is fully aware that there is more to being a hero than just fighting villains. It is about helping people, inspiring them, teamwork, and self-sacrifice. As he said that, a screen behind him showed me saving the black-clad girl. Tape guy saving pipe guy. Black-clad girl and the blonde girl with floating swords fighting back to back. And then me, flying forward and destroying the zero-pointer. Both mom and Sue gasped at that. That is why there is more to the practical exam than just villain points. Participants are also awarded hero points, based on their actions, at the discretion of the judges. And you, young Midoriya, have been awarded 65 hero points. Combined with your 38 villain points, that would give you 103 total points. My eyes widened and I started to tear up. Mom and Sue both went from grabbing my arms to hugging me. Which would be enough to put you at the top of the rankings. All Might's recording continued. Except for one more thing. Mom and Sue both glared at him. And that is the fact that you were only to be penalized for attacking the zero-pointer, if you had any other option. Again the screen changed, and my own words were played back to me. I tried to do the math in my head. I could reach her, but couldn't get her out in time. Not without probably tearing her foot off. But you know how if you bump the bottom of a glass, it just slides, but if you bump the top it tips over. I knew I could do that if I hit the robot in the right spot. I was afraid the head was just come off, so I went for the body. I picked a spot about the center of mass, but not so high that I would lose too much horizontal speed in my jump. We have some pretty sharp people here at UA. All Might once he was back on screen. And they disagree. You should have aimed about 1.6 meters higher. Other than that, you were exactly right. You had no other choice if you wanted to save the young lady. Therefore... All Might grinned as wide as he could. I am happy to announce that you scored 142 points. Not just the highest this year, but the second highest of all time, just seven points below yours truly. Congratulations, young Midoriya, and welcome to the UA Hero Course. The screen shifted from All Might. It showed all 40 members of the two hero courses, and their scores, or recommendation and I immediately returned the hug of the 7th place finisher, Ajrit Siu, who had 61 villain points and 9 hero points. I also noticed in particular, Number 2 Misaka Mikoto, 95 villain points, 2 hero points. Number 3 Mizuno Ami, 80 villain points, 14 hero points. Quest, Mom demanded, but nothing happened. Quest, I said, the tab was flashing. The panels for both quests were flashing. Quest the path of a hero complete. Claim the rewards? 
Accept decline. 100,000 XP received. 5 skill points received. 2 talent point received. Level up. Level 10. Attribute points, plus 7. Skill points, plus 3. Talent points, plus 1. Quest record holder complete. Claim the rewards. Accept decline. Bonus talents received. Energetic student unlocked. Plus ultra unlocked. It looks like you finally caught up. Tsuyu said happily. What do those do? Mom pressed. Energetic student. Reduce energy costs for activated skills by 10%. Increase iteration timer for continuous energy skills by 10%. Prerequisites. Quest reward. Plus ultra. Take a temporary penalty to health to recover energy. One health converts to five energy. This is not damage and cannot be healed. Health reduction will recover at a rate of one per night's sleep. Prerequisites. Graduate from UA. Another one that I shouldn't be able to gain yet, I noted dully. Congratulations, Izuku. Mom clamped down on me. And you too, Tsuyu-chan. Well, I guess we are going to UA, Tsuyu told me. Together. Yes, I nodded, crying openly. Current status. Name, Izuku Midoriya. Race, human, quirk metagene negative. Age 15. Level 10. Active title, The Gamer. Health, 316-316. Energy, 429-429. Attributes. S. Strength, 41. A. Agility, 35. E. Endurance, 36. Q. Yukness, 42. W. It, 33. I. Intuition, 33. C. Charisma 19. D. Determination 42. L. Uck 10. And use points. Attribute 18. Skill 8. Talent 3. Skills. Analyze W33. Dodge A20. Telekinesis I slash D29. Strength training S17. Basic karate. A31. Boxing S23. Parkour A slash Q29. Physical resistance E slash D20. Running Q slash E25. Acrobatics A12. Key detection D slash I19. Key blast D slash W12. Key slice D slash W12. Key healing D slash E15. Key reinforcement D33. Telekinetic attack I slash A18. Tactile TK I slash D6. Telekinetic armor I slash E8. Telekinetic aura I LB15. Kung Fu fundamentals Q slash E12. Meditation W slash I8. Wing Chun Quan A slash Q8. Tai Chi Quan AS9. ASL, W slash A6. JSL, W slash A6. Key diagnosis, D slash W4. User has chosen to conceal, 19 skills. Talents. Studious. Gamer's body. Gamer's mind. Telekinesis, basic. Inventory 2. Reflective dungeon. Free runner. Key Initiate Tactile Telekinesis Key Apprentice Focus Telekinetic Aura Energetic Student Plus Ultra My Hero Playthrough Omake Bad Ending Number 1 I looked down at the letter as my window crumbled. Status I demanded. Nothing happened. Analyze I learned nothing about the letter or the paper it was written on. Then I reached down and lifted up the page telekinetically. I tapped into my key. It seemed the gamer was gone, but my other powers remained. 
I would just have to work on and with them the normal way. I could still do this. Like it said, I could make it from general course into the hero course. This reporter is saddened to report tragedy at UA, the announcer said. Mom and I hugged each other. A group of villains attacked a UA training facility, he continued. In the ensuing battle, pro heroes and UA teachers All Might and Eraserhead were killed, as were five students. Seven other students were taken to the hospital with serious injuries. I shut off the TV and pulled out my phone. I called Sue. It went straight to voicemail. It had taken me three months. Three months of breaking the law, of insane training. But now, I was here. Tamira Shigaraki. I growled. I have finally found you. I will make you pay. Another little NPC. The bastard grimace. Here to bring me to justice for all might. No. I shot back. I'm here for Azri Tsuyu, my best friend. You killed her. And I'm going to kill you. He rolled his eyes at me. Noma. The monster that killed All Might stomped forward. Muspelheim smash! I roared. Two blazing hot blades of key slashed out, cutting the creature in half both horizontally and vertically. My Noma! Shigaraki whined. I didn't care. I charged forward, my hand pulled back. But despite his distraction, Shigaraki stepped in and to the side. He grabbed my other shoulder. I felt my flesh dying, cracking, decaying. Key healing, I declared. But it didn't stop the effect. It only slowed it. My left arm rotted and fell off. Minnesota smash! I didn't care. I shut off the healing. I put all of my strength into my remaining arm. Key and Psions. I still hadn't fully mastered them. It didn't matter. The bastard's torso and head evaporated. My arm shattered. Not that it mattered. The decay continued to spread. I got him, Tsu, I said as I died. Shigaraki is dead, Kurojiri said. It is unfortunately. All for one seemed indifferent. He was an important piece. But as soon as he defeated All Might, his usefulness ended. Prepare the next step. Game over. Retry? Y slash N. Chapter 12 The next two weeks went by startlingly quickly. Because I had passed UA's entrance exam, I was exempt from Aldera's final exams. And the teachers had basically told me I could skip the other days, too. I didn't. Mostly because it wasn't the right thing for a hero to do. And partly because I was hoping to see Mizuno-san and congratulate her. And to be perfectly honest, a small part of me enjoyed the bully's reactions. The last Wednesday, while the rest of my classmates were taking finals, I was getting measured for my uniform and costume. Even though they had the costume mom made for me as a reference. I guess they wanted to be sure. Then on Thursday... I ended up spending most of the day alone, playing games. Tsuyu was not exempt from Danshuin Academy's finals, and Mom had a meeting with her new company. So I spent the morning unlocking Locke's best ending. I expected I wouldn't have a lot of time to play while attending UA. Mom got back just after I finished eating lunch. She was wearing a dress I hadn't seen before and carrying both a garment bag and a briefcase. How did it go? I asked. Very well, she smiled. My initial designs will go on sale in a week, and I received four custom design requests. I am just happy that I don't have to do the materials part of those. That's great, Mom. I congratulated her. There's something else, Zuku, she said more carefully. Then she opened her briefcase and took out a small stack of papers. She gingerly handed them to me. The top of the first page said dissolution of marriage. I looked up at her. Does this mean? I started. I haven't signed them yet, she told me. I know we have talked about it a couple of times, but I wanted to make absolutely sure you were okay with this. Mom, as long as you're happy, I'm fine, I said evenly. I'm not going to be sad or upset about this. I can't miss something I never had. I'm not sure I agree with that, 
She looked at me intently. This is different from being quirkless. I told her. Okay. She agreed. She took the document back from me. Then she flipped through it, signing in a few places. I guess this means this really is the next stage of our lives. I smiled and hugged her. The last day at Aldera was underwhelming. Speeches from the teachers and principal. Making sure we turned in our books. Letting us converse a bit with our classmates. Not that I had anything to say to most of them. Because we were kept with our classes, I wasn't able to talk to Mizuno. I did see her during the principal's final speech. She waved to me. The weekend was nerve-wracking. Tsu and I trained Saturday, but we held off Sunday. We didn't want to be tired out on our first day at UA. Tsuya had to take her siblings to their first day of school. I offered to go with them, but Sammy Dare had vigorously objected. So Tsuya just told me to go on without her. Class 1A. That was the class Tsuya and I were assigned to. The door was huge. And when I opened it, I found I was not the first to arrive. It made sense that Pipe Guy was already there, even at my fastest, he was faster. And I wasn't even using my powers at the moment. As for the other two, maybe they lived close. Or maybe they lived far away, and had to take a train that arrived early. Or maybe they were just really nervous. I shook my head to quit my silent mumbling. Lean back in that chair like that. Pipe guy was berating a guy with spiky red hair. The other boy was seated at one of the desks, but has his chair tilted back on two of its legs. It is disrespectful to the institution. The taller boy kept lecturing. And what would happen if that chair broke? Are you planning to damage your property on your first day? You obvious weren't in the same written exam room as I was. The third person in the room, a slender girl with boyish purple hair, and really, really long earlobes, laughed at Pipe Guy. That's nothing compared to what present Mike was doing to his chair. Besides, the redhead countered. These chairs were made to hold people both larger and heavier than all might. Little old me isn't going to do squat to them. Pipe Guy coughed. Then he noticed me. Ah, you. He motored over to me. You are the one who attacked the zero pointer. Apparently you did make it in. Wait, he's the guy? The girl looked at me in surprise. I know they said wild green hair. But aren't you a little short to be taking out that monster? Nevertheless, he did so. Pipe Guy confirmed. Well, since we will now be classmates, I suppose I should introduce myself. I am Ida Tenya, from Somei Junior High School. Somei, huh? The girl smirked. That explains a lot. Ida? Like Ida Tensei? I began mumbling. I thought he might be related to Ingenium, but I guess this confirms it. Yes. Ida Sen smiled somewhat wistfully. He is my brother. Wow, that's amazing. I continued. Ingenium is so amazing. Oh, I am Midori Ezuku. I just barely managed to rein myself in. Whoa, you are? The redhead exclaimed. You attacked the zero pointer, and you finished in first place? How many points did you earn? Just what they showed, I said sheepishly. It turns out that attacking that giant was the only way to save that girl. So I didn't get penalized in the end. And so many hero points. Edison nodded along with the other boy, despite my protest. Did you realize that there was something more to the exam? No, I was just doing what was right. I shook my head quickly. Hmm. The girl looked at me thoughtfully. Well, I'm Jiro Kyoka. And I'm Kirishima Aijiro. Nice to meet you, number one San. Kirishima San leaned forward out of his chair, offering his hand. I shook it. Then I noticed something behind the teacher's podium. What's that? I asked. Jiro San and Kirishima San both craned their heads around to look. And Ida San turned. It looked like a dirty yellow cocoon. I'm not sure, Ida frowned. Did either of you put it there? They both shook their heads. I whispered, analyze. Urban sleeping bag. An insulated sleeping bag designed to blend into a city environment. Keeps you warm in the cold and cool in the heat. 
Durability, 28 fiftieths. Quality, 2 sevenths. Rank, Name, Shota Aizawa. Race, Human, Quirk Metagene Positive. Age 30. Level, Active Title, Health, Forward Slash, 95%. Stamina, Forward Slash, 42%. Psions, Forward Slash, 37%. Conditions, Asleep. It looks like a sleeping bag, I told them. Indeed it does, Edison noted. I wonder if someone left it there, Kurishima suggested, jumping out of his chair. He walked over. We probably shouldn't touch that, I said quickly. It probably belongs to one of the teachers, and they might not like us messing with it. Good call, he agreed, and Jiro-san gave me a curious look. I sat down at my assigned desk and started thinking. I've never seen anything like that on Analyze before I considered does his quirk block it. Or maybe it's like some online games, where you can't skin something if it is too much higher level than you. Skills, I whispered. Analyze. I had never used Analyze on Analyze before. I hadn't seen a need, and frankly it was a bit meta. But now the extended explanation confirmed it would provide limited data on anyone more than 10 levels higher than me. Unless I acquired that information another way. Not that anyone would be able to tell me their level or health. Unless they were in my party, which is probably what the description meant. It also confirmed there might be things that could partially or fully block analyze. But also, that only applied to the real world. Anything in dungeons was fair game. What are you doing? A familiar voice whispered in my ear. Only gamer's mind kept me from jumping. Good morning to see you. I said normally, then added softly. There is someone in that sleeping bag. I analyzed it to see what it was and got the person inside too. I'm guessing a staff member, maybe even our homeroom teacher. But analyze was partially blocked, which hasn't happened before. So I wanted to see if I could find out why. And what did it? Sue started to ask, but was cut off. You. Angry and familiar voice growled, accompanied by the door slamming, and then stomped over to us. As much as someone could stomp on this kind of reinforced floor, when she weighed maybe 53 kilograms soaking wet. Good morning, Masaka-san, I said carefully. Did I do something wrong? You had me worried that you might not make it in, she said harshly. All that talk about penalties and the lowest scores. You made me think the first halfway decent guy I've met in years might not even make it. Was it all an act? Did you already think you took the top spot? Tsuyu regarded the other woman warily. I knew her well enough to see the muscles in her legs tensing, in case she had to jump between Masaka and me. I just sighed and smiled sadly. No, that was all true, Misaka-san. I told her. I didn't know any more about the hero points than you did and Recovery Girl made it sound like I would be penalized. As I said that, the door slid open again, and a full six of my new classmates walked in, including two I recognized. And the hologram from the school. Did you all get those two, I'm guessing? I continued as both of the newcomers I knew gravitated over to the three of us. Misaka-san nodded, as did a tall guy with a mask and six arms. Well, in the hologram, All Might told me that I only had 38 points and should have failed. I remembered. And only then did he tell me about the hero points, and that I had made it. And after that, he explained that the judges confirmed my calculations, and that I didn't have any other option, so I wasn't getting penalized. Calculations? Mizuno-san asked as she reached us, sounding very interested. Hello, Mizuno-san. I smiled happily at her. And congratulations on making it in. Thank you, she said, blushing slightly. You too. Mizuno-san? Tsuyu tilted her head and brought her finger to her lips. Do you mean that Mizuno-san? Yes, I agreed. Tsuyu, Misaka-san, this is Mizuno-Ami, a fellow graduate of Aldera Junior High, 
and probably the smartest person in our grade level without a genius type quirk. Mizuno san, these are my friends, Ajri Tsuyu and Masaka Mikoto. Masaka san grinned for a second, then gave me the stink eye and demanded. If I'm your friend too, why don't you call me by my given name? Tsuya asked me to. I said simply. You didn't. Her jaw dropped. Are you Tsundara Mikoto-chan? Tsuya asked bluntly. If you don't mind, Mizuno-san said. You could call me by my given name too. Izuka-kun. Sure, Ami-chan. Mikoto-chan. Behind them, the mute girl, looking slightly uncomfortable, started to sign something when she was cut off. It's you! Yet another feminine voice, this one slightly familiar, exclaimed. Though this one was happy. The girl I had saved rushed over to my desk. You did make it. She sounded overjoyed and a bit relieved. What is with that guy? A female uniform floating in midair asked, amused. Only then did I realize a quarter of the class had congregated around my desk. And they were all very attractive and female. All right. A deep voice prevented me from responding. It looks like you are all here. I noticed a few more people had entered, and quick check of key detection confirmed 21 people were in the room. And determined to prevent me from sleeping, the sleeping bag unzipped from the inside. A slender, rough-looking man scrunched out and staggered to his feet. All of you, take your assigned seats and we'll get started. We all just stared at him. He frowned. Heroes have to make split-second decisions. Aizawa-san sounded annoyed. It doesn't bode well for you if such a simple instruction confuses you. Shouldn't you tell us who you are before you start giving orders? A blonde girl barked back. He actually blinked in surprise at that, like he hadn't realized. I'm Aizawa Shota, your homeroom teacher. Now sit down so we can get on with self-introductions. You should scan the others, Tsuyu whispered before slipping away. I was already in my spot, and it only took the others a few seconds to get situated. Great, let's just do this in seat order, Aizawa-sensei instructed. Give your name, the name of your quirk, and a brief description of what you think it does. That turn of phrase interested me. But the first student stood quickly, so I grabbed a fresh notebook and the pencil of solitude and prepared to take notes. Bonjour, J.M. Appel. Name, Yuga Aoyama. Level 8. Quirk, Naval Laser. Despite the name, his quirk is actually a beam of concussive force accompanied by sparkly golden light, not an actual laser. Overuse of this quirk can have Digestive Repercussions. Mina Ishido. Level 9. Quirk, Acid. She can create acids from her skin, strong or weak, slippery or sticky. She is somewhat resistant to acids, but stronger ones or long exposure can still burn her. See you, Adri. Level 10. Quirk Frog. Does whatever a frog can. Any frog, actually. See hero note number 15. Tenya Ida. Level 11. Quirk Engine. Has orange juice powered engines in his lower legs, partly organic and partly mechanical. Can run very fast and kick very hard. Ochako Uraraka. Level 8. Quirk, zero gravity. More like a floating power, since items hover, but don't just go flying into space as the earth moves. Though maybe that is just the friction of the air? Mashireo Ojiro. Level 12. Quirk tail. Has a thick, heavy tail. Strong enough to support his body weight, and then some. Not prehensile. Mikoto Misaka, Tsuyu is right, seems a bit sundera. Level 14. Quirk, Electromaster. Generates and stores electricity in her body. Can discharge it, or use it to manipulate magnetic fields. Aijiro Kurishima. Level 11. Quirk, hardening. Can create a layer of thick spiky material over his skin. It looks mostly like skin, but as hard as stone, without losing flexibility. 
Koji Koda. Level 8. Quirk Ani Voice. Can talk to and control animals. Doesn't seem to like talking. Rock-like appearance is not related to his quirk. Doesn't seem to like talking. Ami Mizuno. Level 9. Quirk Ice Water. Can control water and ice. Can control them better the closer to freezing they are. Can control a larger volume and with greater precision. Mizo Shoji. Level 12. Quirk Dupli Arms. Has six tentacle-like arms that can morph into other parts of the human body. Hands, eyes, mouths, etc. Uses them to speak for some reason. Kyokajiro. Level 10. Quirk, earphone jack. Her earlobes are waist length and end in headphone jacks. They work in traditional electronics, but she can also hear and transmit sonic vibrations through them. Hanta Siro. Level 10. Quirk Tape His elbows look like action figure joints and produce a cellophane tape. It shoots out up to 50 meters, and is strong enough to hold his body weight and more. Ask if the tape is an electrical insulator or has other special properties. Fumikage Tokoyami Level 11 Quirk Dark Shadow Dark Shadow is a living shadow that is connected to him and seems to be at least partially independent can become tangible or solid, and expand, at will. Shoto Todoroki, same family name as Endeavor, son? Level 17. Quirk, half cold, half hot. Can create and control ice from his right side and fire from his left side. How does his ice control compare to ice water? Toru Hagakure. Level 9. Quirk, invisibility. She is transparent. Applies only to herself. She can't turn it off. Madura Penryu, blonde hair and slight English accent, said to call her. Mo Chan. Level 12. Quirk, Calabazi. Can bond with three swords. After bonded, she can sheathe them, extra-dimensional, intangible, and control them with a range of about four meters. This control strengthens the swords and prevents other quirks like telekinesis or magnetism from controlling them. I set left my notebook open and stood up. But I kept my pencil. My name is Midori Izuku. I announce. My power is tactile telekinesis. I can telekinetically manipulate things I am touching. I held up my right hand pinky out. The pencil of solitude hung from it like a stalactite. Then it moved up of the outside of the joint, and stood on my nail like a stalagmite. Then it kept going and began to circle my finger like a propeller. Mostly, I use it on myself. I continued catching the pencil, to increase my strength and speed, and to protect myself from attacks. Nice to meet you all, please take care of me. The mute girl, who was seated next to me, stood up. Analyze told me she was level 13, along with the other data. She started to write on a pad. I can interpret if you like? I offered. Backslash are you sure? Slash she signed. Yes, I said signing as I spoke. I was embarrassed by how rusty I was at the exam, so I have been brushing up. My fingers must have matched my words, because she looked relieved and thanked me. My name is Cassandra Kane, I said for her. Cassandra is my given name. My quirk is called Silent Grace. It is a hybrid of my parents' quirks. One is the ability to detect movement in close to medium range. The other is incredible flexibility and muscle control. Where they combined. I looked at her and signed, backslash sorry I missed that, slash. Oh, because of how they combine, I am very good at reading body language. The drawback is I cannot speak. Even laughing or crying, I am silent. And if I try to force it, it causes me terrible headaches. Migraines, Shoji-san offered. But the signs are basically the same. Backslash thank you, slash she told me again, and Shoji-san too. Then she sat down, leaving the last student. I quickly jotted down some notes on Cassandra and Silent Grace. I noticed that I had written everyone's names in Western order 
and wondered if I was getting too used to the gamer showing names like that. Before I could think on that too much. Momo Yayorosa. Level 16. Quirk Creation. Can convert her body's lipids into anything, as long as she understands the structure, be it mechanical or chemical. Right. Aizawa sensei yawned. Now get changed into your P uniforms. Time for a pop quiz. Sensei, what about the orientation? Ida-san asked as forcefully as he dared. We don't have time to waste on that. Aizawa rolled his eyes. Now get a move on. Anyone not outside in five minutes will be penalized. Shoji, Aizawa sensei said as soon as we were all assembled. In your middle school, they did ball throwing tests, right? The tall boy nodded. What was your record? 68.3 meters. Shoji-san said out of a mouth formed on his middle, left arm. And that is without your quirk, right? The tired teacher asked. Yes. The Ministry of Education is not very rational. Aizawa-sensei lectured. They insist on pretending everyone is still the same. Outside of private schools and other special circumstances. We all glanced at Mikoto-san, jayorosa san or Todoroki-san. Not only do you not learn how to use your quirks, you are actively discouraged from doing so. That ends now. He picked up a softball and tossed it to Shoji-san. Try throwing it with your quirk, Aizawa-sensei told him. Anything goes, as long as you stay in the circle. Shoji-san looked at the ball and then took it in his left hand. His middle left arm sprouted another elbow and forearm, ending in a hand. The entire, now three-segmented, arm also filled out with about a 20% increase in muscle mass. His top right arm grabbed the second part of the middle arm, and the bottom arm lengthened to grab the outermost segment of the middle arm. His three right arms more or less joined, Shoji-san passed the ball over to his free right hand. He took a pitcher stance and threw the softball with the composite strength of all three arms, plus the extra centripetal force of having lengthened his arm. The ball soared away. 318.2 meters. Aizawa-sensei showed us the result on his phone. Not bad. Then he addressed us more seriously. This is a quirk assessment test. You will all be undergoing eight standard fitness tests, plus a ninth one of my own design. You will be expected to make full use of your quirks in these tests. And in the end, whoever comes in last place will be immediately expelled. What? Kurishima-san gaped, as many of the others did silently. Can he really expel us from Yue? Ami-chan mused sadly. I don't know, Ida-san answered. I suppose I should clarify. Aizawa brightened slightly. Since it seems one of you is capable of rational thought. It is true, I can't kick you out of UA. I can kick you out of the hero course. From there, it is up to the principal and the other teachers if they can find a spot for you in support or general. But that's your problem, not mine. He went back to scowling and glaring. You are not here to have fun or make friends. This is the best hero course in Asia, if not the whole world, for a reason. If you can't control your powers, if your quirks aren't up to par, you will get yourselves killed. Or worse, get others killed. So you are going to show me that you belong here. Can we at least know what the tests are? I asked, trying not to let my doubts show. 50 meter dash, standing long jump, endurance run, ball throw, ball catch. Aizawa sensei answered. Then we go inside, for repeated side steps, sit ups, pull ups, and grip strength. Ball catch? More than one of my classmates echoed. He ignored us. The dash went about like you might expect. Ida-san came in first, still faster than I could be if I went all out. Shoji-san actually came in second, converting four of his arms into legs, and running like a horse. Limiting myself to drive two, I came in third, and Tsu was fourth. There were a few interesting showings. Like Aoyama-san who jumped up and used his power to jet almost 30 meters, faster than even Ida-san. Then his power seemed to run out, and he staggered the rest of the way, clutching his stomach. He barely came in tenth. 
and Siro san shot his tape into the fence and used that to pull himself. Tsuyu naturally won the long jump. Yurarika san was second, making herself weightless, though she looked a bit green after. Aoyama used the same trick, but this time it was enough to get him third place. After making us run for an hour, Aizawa gave us a 15-minute break to use the restroom and get something to drink. Then it was time for the ball throw. I ended up waiting in line behind Ami and Makoto, and in front of Todoroki-san. And the electrokinetic was scowling. How is this rational? She hissed softly at me. These tests obviously favor people with a physical mutation or personal enhancement quirks. How are invisibility, or sonic earlobes, or animal control supposed to help here? Or what if someone had something like telepathy, or Sir Naitai's precognition? Well, I mused. Kodasan could call a bird, and have it carry the ball as far as it can. And Hagakure-san could pretend to throw the ball and just run with it. Though that might not fool Aizawa-sensei. I'm not sure how Jiro-san's power can be used for this. Or Sir Naitai. Hmm. Mikoto-chan gave me an appraising look. And what would you do here if you had my quirk? Well, the balls have electronics, right? I said. So there is probably some metal in there. Didn't you say at the arcade that you magnetically shoot the tokens? So you could do the same with the ball. She nodded, grinning. What about me? Ami asked. I was thinking about surrounding the ball with water and floating it out as far as I could before squeezing the water to shoot it a bit farther. That's probably better than what I thought. I told her. My first idea is that you should wrap your body in water and use it to supplement your muscles. Like a suit of power armor. That might not be good here, but maybe for the pull-ups? Yes. I will consider that. We watched as Yayorosa San formed with looked like a grenade launcher and shot one of the balls just over a kilometer. Tokoimi stepped behind her and squinted up at the bright sunlight. Why are you helping them? Todoroki-san asked. But his flat voice was more curious than accusatory. I might not have caught that if not for all the time I had spent with Sue and her siblings. 247.1 meters, Aizawa-sensei announced for my bird-faced classmate. They are my classmates, I said a bit confused. Then I remembered he hadn't gone through the entrance exam, hadn't earned points for helping others. It might not have mattered for this test, but it was already my nature, and the result of the exam had driven it home for me. 314 meters even, our teacher read off Ami-chan's results. And what if helping everyone else somehow puts you into last place? The scarred boy asked. In that case, I win. I told him with a big open smile. Then I went to take my place on deck. Mikoto picked up one of the remaining softballs. She tossed it and caught it, sparks dancing across her fingers. Then she smirked, broadly and dangerously. She threw the ball a bit higher and assumed a stance. Body slightly turned arm out. Her hand positioned like she was going to flip a coin, except tilted further forward. The ball dropped. Lighting flowed visibly down her arm. Her thumb flicked the ball. Boom! The air around us shook as the softball went supersonic. Jiro-san whimpered a bit and covered her ears. A few others looked shocked, puns slightly intended but Tsi just shook her head in amusement. 1.72 kilometers. Aizawa-sensei couldn't keep all the amazement out of his voice. Though that's only because it hit the back wall and according to this, destroyed the ball. Not quite infinite, but well done. Waiting off to the side, Yurarika-san blushed as he reminded her of her impossible score. As Mikoto-san sat down with the others who had already thrown, I took a softball and stepped into the circle. My throwing skill hadn't improved in a while, so I would be relying mostly on strength. I wound up and... 422.8 meters. Aizawa-sensei studied me as he said it. I turned to leave, but he stopped me. Do you think you can get through this half-assing it? He said pointedly. You think maybe because you had the top score, you'll get some sort of special pass? Not at all. I shook my head broadly 
dismayed by his words. He looked a bit surprised at my reaction. I saw what you did in the exam, he said a little less sharply. Not just at the end either. Why are you holding back? I'm not really holding back, I explained sheepishly, more pacing myself. I mean, my power is kind of like a water tank with a spigot. You can open it a little to fill up a glass, or a lot to fill up a wading pool. But the amount of water it holds doesn't change, and once you run out, you can't get any more until you refill it. The entrance exam was only ten minutes. We already had to run an hour and still have five more tests to go. So that last attack, against the zero pointer, that was like opening up this spigot all the way. Sensei asked? No, that's more of a special case, where I bashed the spigot off with a sledgehammer. I said looking at my right arm. Sure, you get the water out really fast, but in the end, the tank is still broken until you fix it. Hmm. <laughs> he considered that. Fine, go sit down. I was still thinking about his first question. Did I think I could get through this? I had placed in the top five for the first three events and was currently fourth for this one. The way he said it. It was confirming my suspicions. I sat down next to Tsuyu and began to whisper softly. I tried to use my TK to direct my words to her ears, but I wasn't sure how well it was working. Still, she nodded when I finished. I caught Kane San's eye and then signed three quick questions to her. Her eyes widened for a moment, then she signed back an affirmative. Shoji-san also noticed, and signed his desire to help. After the last throw was measured, Aizawa-sensei had us line up again for the next test, in front of what he called a modified tennis ball launcher. Said modified tennis ball launcher looked more like a Gatling grenade launcher. The support course put this together. He told us with a gleam in his eye. It fires two balls per shot, 30 times per minute. Each shot is anywhere from 120 to 150 kilometers per hour. Each of you gets 90 seconds to catch as many balls as you can. Hopefully without getting knocked unconscious. So who's first? How about? No. I stated, my voice soft but carrying. Tsu Kainsan, Shoji-san, and I all charged Aizawa-sensei. We each took a slightly different course, not knowing his quirk. A moment later, Makoto joined in, despite not knowing the plan. I went straight in, and high, hoping to keep his attention on me. I believed I could still take a hit better than anyone in the class, except Kurishima-san. Shoji-san came in waist height from the right, and Tsuyu at knee level from his left. Cassandra, meanwhile, was sneaking in silently from behind. Makoto-san chose to follow me, her hand crackling. Aizawa-sensei confirmed that he was a pro by reacting immediately. He glared at me, and then frowned deeply. He grabbed his scarf. It snapped out at me like a whip. Just before it reached me, it stopped and twisted in on itself. Nice metal weave in there, Mikoto-san commented. Sensei turned his gaze on her. The sparks on Mikoto-chan stopped, and his scarf fell limp. He aimed it at me again still looking at the electrokinetic. I caught the unusual weapon on my arm, wrapped it around my wrist, and used it to pull myself closer. As I grabbed his arms and pinned them, Tsuyu's tongue snagged his legs, pulling him down to his knees. Shoji-sen arrived a moment later and helped me hold Aizawa-sensei. What are you doing to my quirk? Mikoto-sen demanded. You are Eraserhead, I realized then quickly shook my head. Not the time. I looked over at the rest of my classmates, who were staring at us. Most of their jaws were hanging open. Go, I told them. Get out of here. Find the other teachers or the principal and let them know. Nobody moved. What the hell are you doing? Aizawa-sensei demanded angrily. Capturing the villain, Tsuya said. We weren't supposed to? I asked seriously. Explain, he ordered, but he also calmed down a little. You used coercion and blackmail, I said, to basically kidnap us and force us to compete in a contest for our survival. An arbitrary contest, Shoji-san added, 
one without rules that we are aware of, if there are any. And then there was the villain rant against the government, Mikoto chimed in, which was completely at odds with what you are actually doing. The only way it could have been more obvious, Ribbit, was if you told us to pair up and fight to the death. Aizawa-sensei looked around at the five of us for a moment. Then he started chuckling. I've been doing this for six years now, he said between laughs. And you are the first ones to figure that out. So this wasn't really a test? Ashido-san sounded confused. It was, Ami countered, just a multifaceted one. And you can let me go now, Aizawa-sensei said, a bit of anger returning to his voice. We released him. Then Shoji-san and Kane-san moved out of his range. So we were not in danger of being expelled? Aoyama asked. That was just a rational deception, Sensei said, to sell it and make you try your best. Liar, Mikoto-san said angrily. I know you've kicked people out of the hero course on the first day. And not just one. Or did you think Tokawada I wouldn't keep records? The reason we weren't told the scoring rules, I said, is because there weren't any. He could decide who is last, or tied for last based on his own judgment. Claim that certain tests were higher rank than others. Then, if he decided not to expel anyone, he could exempt them because two or more people were tied for lowest score. Conversely, Yayoro's amused. He could do the same thing, and move all of the people in last place out of the hero track. Sensei grimaced. You figured it out, he said flatly. Congratulations, no one will be expelled. But we are still going to finish the test. I don't think so, Todoroki-san said just as emotionlessly. After all of this, I doubt I can trust you. A teacher who does not respect the rules. How will I know if what you are teaching me is real, or another veiled test? I intend to go to the orientation, or to the principal if it is done and asked to be moved to a different class. I would suggest you all do the same. Wait, I protested, wondering if I had made a mistake. Sure, this whole test was mean-spirited and maybe counterproductive. But still, it would be good to get a handle on our quirks, and to help us realize that villains aren't always obvious. The rest of the class seemed to be listening to Todoroki. Only Tsuyu Ami Yurarika-san and I were not moving, Mikoto-san gave me a regretful shrug as she went with the crowd. Hold on there, a new voice proclaimed. A giant, golden voice. One I was highly familiar with. Young Todoroki. All Might proclaimed, walking out from behind the gym. I know that Aizawa-sensei's methods and personality can be a little rough. But he has the full support of the UA staff. And more importantly, he gets results. We teachers all have to play the villain in some classes. And in real life we don't get a warning before a villain acts. Then All Might's smile changed to one of pure amusement, and he chuckled. At least not most of the time. The symbol of peace sobered again, and addressed my classmates. So I asked that you give him a chance. They looked around. A few noticed that I wasn't moving to leave. After another moment, most of them relaxed. All right, Todoroki relented. Excellent. All Might smiled broadly. Then why don't all of you go grab lunch, and you can finish the assessment afterwards, without the additional theatrics. Because it does help to get a baseline of both your physical and quirk abilities. That seemed to get everyone's attention, and I heard a few stomachs rumbling. It must have been hard for you, All Might said, after the teens had left pretending like you were happy that they called you on this. I didn't need your help, Aizawa told the larger man. And if they had all left? Yagi rumbled. You may have been able to expel an entire class in the past. Niza stepped out from behind the gym. But that wouldn't fly this time. This group has too much promise, and some of them have too strong of a backing. Especially when you have been warned about alienating your students with this tactic. You must have the trust of those you are teaching. That boy, Midoriya. Aizawa changed the subject. What is he? What do you mean? Niza frowned. 
My cork didn't work on him. Both Yagi and Niza blinked, then exchanged thoughtful looks. Your cork doesn't work on everyone. All Might noted. That's mutation types, Eraserhead said. I've never met an emitter than I couldn't stop. Perhaps his power isn't actually telekinetic, the principal mused. No, I saw him use it to make a pencil move. Aizawa shook his head. What are you suggesting? All Might pressed. I don't know, Eraserhead admitted. The rest of the first day went a lot smoother. We finished all the tests, and Aizawa Sensei ranked us strictly on the average of how we placed in each test. I ended up in first place again, having cleared top five in each activity. Now it was our second day of class. We had normal classes in the morning. Then Aizawa Sensei checked us back and after lunch. After verifying we were back, he hurried out, presumably to get to his next class. And moments later, I am here, entering the room like a hero, All Might exclaimed, as he proceeded to do the exact opposite of what he was saying. Well, he did enter the room, I guess. But shouting it, while sliding in, in an ego pose. I admired All Might to no end, but it didn't actually seem heroic. Whatever, it was All Might. In his Silver Age costume, he was here to teach us. I tightly buttoned down my nerve to mumble. Or even just squee. Good afternoon, my students, he declared. This is the first day of your Hero Fundamentals class. I was planning on plunging right in with urban battle training. But I was told it may be too soon for that. Plus, a few of your costumes are not yet ready. They were sent to some hot new designer for redesigns. And most importantly, three of the urban training arenas are still being repaired after the entrance exam practicals. He looked at Ami-san and Mikoto-san when he said that. And other four are being used by your upperclassmen. Therefore, I would like you all to change into your P-uniforms and meet me on the football pitch. You all made it here quickly. All Might smiled broadly. It looks like Aizawa's tactics did you some good after all. Todoroki and Mikoto both flinched. So, for today's training, we are going to play a little lions and gazelles, he continued, and received a number of blank looks. Don't know that one? he asked, a bit less exuberantly. Well, it's a variation of tag. Two of you will be lions, and the rest will be gazelles. Lions have five minutes to tag as many gazelles as they can, and gazelles try not to get tagged. If a gazelle gets tagged, they are out, and must immediately leave the field. Which is the second part? You are limited to the football pitch. If you leave it, you are disqualified. If a gazelle leaves it to try to escape a lion, they are considered tagged. He paused as if for questions, but continued before I could ask. Each gazelle is worth one point, he explained. If a gazelle manages to avoid both lions for the full five minutes, they get the point. Otherwise the lion who tags them gets the point. This is training, he said a bit more sternly. Lions, you are the heroes trying to capture the villainous gazelles. Gazelles, you are heroes trying to dodge the villainous lions who are trying to kill you. You may all use your quirks and whatever other skills you may possess. This is training, he repeated, almost threateningly. If any of you hurts another, you will forfeit your points to that person. And while I am not going to make silly or empty threats, points here will be counted towards your grades. Are we ready? I quickly put my hand up. Yes, young Midoriya? All Might knew my name. All Might recognized me on sight. No, not the time to geek out. All Might Sensei, I said. What do you mean by tag? What do I mean by tag? He parroted uncertainly. Well, like Shoji-san, he can have up to six hands, and can even grow extra arm segments to increase his reach. But any of his hands are valid for a tag, right? Yes, that is correct. All Might nodded. But does it have to be hands? Aida-san's legs are faster than his hands, would a foot tap count as a tag? Or Tsu's tongue, it's prehensile. And Tokoyami-san's dark shadow has hands. What if Ami-chan makes giant water hands? All very good questions, All Might told me. No feet, 
no tongues, no elbows, no headbutts, and no manifestations of your powers. You can use all those things to try to reel a gazelle in, but only if you touch them with your hand are they out. Okay, thank you, sensei. I bowed slightly to him. In that case, why don't you be a lion first, young Midoriya? You and young Hagakure. We all moved on to the soccer field. Everyone else formed a ring around us. Not too close to us, but not close to the edge either. Then, Hagakure started to unzip her uniform. What are you doing? I stammered as I was suddenly shown under her shirt. It was nothing, of course. Just the back side of said shirt, slightly shadowed. She wasn't even wearing underwear to show the shape of her body. But it was the principle of the thing. Stealth hunting. She declared in acute attempt at a predatory tone. Right, five minutes starts in three, two, one. I had two options. If the field was smaller, or I had a quirk that could shrink it like Todoroki-san, it would be better to go after the stronger, faster gazelles first. That way, there would be more people to get in each other's way. But on a soccer field, there was plenty of room for everyone to move freely. So instead, I went for the slowest ones first. Kodasan was easy enough to tag. He whistled up a pair of little birds to try to distract me. But they were not used to getting close to humans, so I was able to slip past them and tap his arm. Tag! Hagakure-san's voice rang out, and Todoroki-san stumbled forward. He sighed, and headed for the edge of the arena. I had turned towards Siro-san. Jiro-san would have been a slower target, but she was at the far side of the pitch. And based on where Todoroki-san had been, Hagakure was probably closer. Oh man! Siro-san slumped at I lightly slapped his back. Jiro-san stabbed one of her earlobes into the ground. Then a second later, she dove to the side. She can hear Hagakure's footsteps. I mumbled, targeting Penryu, targeting Emochan next. In the end, I scored nine points, and Hakagure had six. Only Ida-san, Mikoto-chan, and Tokoimi-san were able to avoid us or keep us at bay. Ami-chan almost survived but I was able to push through her water shield just before time expired. All right, good job. All Might praised us. Some interesting uses of your quirks. Do we have any volunteers to be the next lions? I'll do it. The pink hued Ashido-san raised her hand and waved it around. Thank you, young Ashido. Anyone else? No? Then let's go with young Koda. All right, everyone back on the field. We all complied, but this time I took a spot on the outer ring, and I assumed Hagakure-san did, too. Her uniform was still folded up on the sidelines. Ready? Three, two, one, go! Kodasan trilled, and this time it wasn't two birds. It was at least two dozen, and three different species. They descended on Ida-san, flapping in his face, swarming around his legs, and tugging at his shirt. It was enough to slow him down, and the rock-faced boy looked elated as he tagged the speedster. While I was seemingly distracted, a shido sand slid towards me on a noxious-smelling gel. This is for last time. She reached out for me. Instead, I slipped around her and grabbed the back of her uniform jacket. I lifted her up, carried her quickly to the edge of the pitch, and dropped her outside. Lion Ashido is out of bounds, all Might sounded gobsmacked. What? She complained. How? It only counts as a tag if you touch me with your hands, I reminded her. And we are supposed to do everything we can to avoid you. It seems like taking you out is the safest and simplest way. The rest of the class rounded on Kodasan, some of their expressions downright biastial. Hmm, that was a miscalculation, All Might noticed. The whole match was over in 30 seconds. Okay, All Might Sensei announced. We will complete the matches under this set of rules, to be fair. But obviously, this was not the intended result, and next time the rules will be different. As we wrapped up and began to head inside, I couldn't help myself. Analyze. Name? All Might. Race, human? Age? Level? Active title, the symbol of peace. 
health forward slash 80% stamina forward slash 76% conditions systemic organ damage lethal exotic matter toxicity mandatory quest alert save the symbol of peace prevent the death of all might rewards talent 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 failure penalties the end of peace and stability time limit 118 days accept i stopped dead in my tracks gaping wow what a ride right part two of what if deku had the gamer powers was absolutely mind-blowing i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did if you're as hyped as i am don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Your support means the world to me, and I can't wait to see your theories and reactions in the comments below. If you haven't subscribed yet, you're missing out on some epic content. Hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and be the first to know when part 3 drops. We've got some incredible surprises in store, and you won't want to miss a single moment. Once again, Thank you for being the best viewers ever. Your continuous support keeps this channel going, and I can't wait to bring you more thrilling adventures. Until next time, this is Kronos, signing off. Catch you in the next video, my awesome friends.